Freedom, man. That's what it's all about. You've got to groove on freedom, like the good book says. listening to what on earth is happening this show will discuss the topics of human consciousness mind control natural law the occult and all issues that affect the freedom of the people of earth what on earth is happening will endeavor to shine light upon the darkness of our world and to offer empowering solutions to the problems we face as humanity approaches its critical moment of choice. And now, here is your host, Mark Passio. Welcome one and all, you're watching What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. Ladies and gentlemen, government is slavery. Thanks for tuning into the show today. Today is Sunday, September 1st, 2019. This is episode number 221 of What on Earth is Happening. We have a great show lined up for you here today. Today's show is all about the first ever Anarchadelphia coming up here in Philadelphia, September 13th through 15th, 2019. Looking very much forward to being part of this great conference here in Philadelphia. Today I am joined live in studio with the conference, one of the conference's main organizers, Carmen Karanji. Carmen, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Mark. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So Carmen, I want to just jump right in. We're going to actually have also three other great guests. We're going to be talking to uh, your co-organizer, Pat Leach, via Skype. We're going to be talking to two other speakers, uh, including Derek Brose and Etienne de la Boussy. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. You can uh, correct me if if that's incorrect. But um, uh, Carmen, I want to start off with you and uh, just uh, let the listening audience know a little bit about what's going to be happening uh, in just a couple weeks right here in Philadelphia as part of Anacradelphia. Well, we're really excited. It's a three-day event, Friday the 13th, Saturday the 14th, and Sunday the 15th. We have an amazing lineup of speakers. You, obviously, Derek, Etienne de la Boise Square, Jeff Burrick, a lot of other people, Clive DeCall. we got a whole host of people that are bringing a lot of different um, sort of perspectives into this one melting pot. The three main subjects that we're kind of tackling is occultism, occulted knowledge, cryptocurrency, and, you know, how blockchains are revolutionizing economy and finance, and then the political theory of anarchy, self-ownership. And so we have uh, all these speakers coming together to do all this, but we also are making sure this is a very fun and sort of like memorable event. So we have like stuff happening at night every every evening. We have um, sort of like a uh, sort of like two shows at the one night, and then the the blowout at the very end. We're gonna have a huge uh, skate par- skate competition for pro skaters at FDR down the street, and then a concert after that. So it's going awesome. to be very fun and also very enlightening. Okay, so that's what's kind of setting this one apart. You're really incorporating some uh, additional social events into this conference as well, in addition to just the educational outreach to, Absolutely. The, uh, to the attendees. We believe that, you know, it is about human connection at the end of the day, and that's how we're really going to sell anarchy to people. Like, you're not just, if somebody's just yelling at you on Facebook through a text screen, it's not as effective as if somebody looks you in the eye and, you know, touches your heart a little bit with something that affected them that made them feel this way. Now, tell people a little bit about the venue for the event. All right, so the venue is actually what's really exciting because it's it's almost like two venues in one. So you have the inside of the venue, Galdo's Catering, which is a huge catering hall, a giant main floor that's going to have, you know, all the speakers speaking and stuff like that, plenty of vestibules, there's bars inside, there'll be food to order. But then outside is a gigantic, even bigger parking lot, even more square feet, and we have a giant sort of like outdoor agorist-like extravaganza, if you will. We have, um, we're having 
this we but we got a giant tent put up to where anyone can come and for like a small fee get a piece of a table and sell their wares whether it's you know the soap that you make or maybe some glass bowls that you make um we're gonna have a bunch of food truck vendors out of there i got a lot of the uh, philly vegan pop flea type food right. truck vendors coming through and then part of the we're doing a lot of fundraisers for the free ross project but my favorite one is the one we're doing <laughs> outside we have a dunk tank and we bought a bunch of uh, presidential masks <laughs> and it's gonna be called dunk trump for ross so you can like you know pay a couple of money to throw like <laughs> balls and try to dunk a fake donald trump <laughs> into like a dunk tank i mean i like the idea that you're bringing some food trucks there uh with vegan food because you know it, sometimes people when they come to a conference you know, they have to make a lot of compromises on like what they're going to eat, especially if they have any dietary restrictions like being vegan. So, um, you know, I'm glad that you're doing that because that gives people an easy access to get, you know, some good, healthy vegan food while they're actually at the event. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, could, I relate to that personally. You know what I mean? I went to a, <laughs> another conference. I don't want to I don't want to dime them out, but uh, we ordered a, a vegan entree at one of the dinners and it, it had, um, you know, like dairy in it. You know what I mean? Because the chef wasn't too keen on, you know, what vegan actually means. So, yeah, we want to make sure that that I just covered from a personal perspective and just in general. That's great. Now, uh, tell us a little bit about some of the speakers that are going to be at the event. Well, I'm really excited for Derek, who will be joining us soon. Dude's running for mayor, Houston. It's balling, in my opinion. I think it's one of the coolest things. I was actually, me and Pat, two hours before this, were, were on Ken Bozak's podcast, and I was talking about him running for mayor of Houston. It's inspired me to maybe one day run for mayor of Philly on the platform of dismantling the PPA. I think I would have enough support <laughs> if, I ta if I took on the parking authority. So that's I'm really excited for that. Of course, um, Etienne de la Boise Squared will be joining us in this call as well. And I just reread his book again, Understanding Your Slavery. It's a great book that, like, it's just a very, like, straightforward, non-emotional way of putting forth the truth that we are under control by what he refers to as intergenerational organized crime. And I feel like that's the most logical, least emotionally charged way to, like, nail that concept. And then we have Gina Carr, who's going to be a vegan speaker. I, I, I figure I'd throw her in there because I want to make sure. You oh, know, she's great. Yeah, she's awesome. She really has the full bo body of research to, for anybody who's like on the fence about that kind of thing. And uh, Max Egan's going to be part of yes, it. Yes, yes, Max Egan's coming. He's also doing a workshop as well. And then, of course, you, my friend, the I keynote am, uh, speaker. I am preparing my presentation, uh, almost to finish my main presentation called The Sacred Gift of Anger. I think people are going to be pretty impressed with what I have to share regarding that. Uh, I think they've seen a lot of it in the last uh, few weeks uh, here on the show. Um, but, uh, you know, before we uh, go to some other things regarding the conference, because I, we actually are going to screen, uh, you're helping edit the documentary of uh, Mark Passio and, this, and the Science of Natural Law, which is my pr premier documentary, first ever documentary film that I've uh, ventured into making. Uh, we're going to actually premiere the rough cut of that. It's not going to be the very finished final version, but we have a pretty decent rough cut uh, prepared to screen. And um, we have a little um, trailer clip of that that I'm going to show the, the listening audience on the show here today. So um, let me just go through a couple of uh, things very quickly um, ab about at least what I have planned for this uh, event. Hold on one moment and jump into the slides and we can cut over to the laptop real quick. So um, this is the title card for today's show. Uh, it looks like we're having a technical issue. Uh, no, no, we're not. There we go. Let me just uh, hit play on my slides. Okay, so um, this is the title card for today's show about uh, Anarchadelphia. Uh, thanks to Brett for making the great graphics. Uh, of course, our guests, Derek Bros, Carmen, Pat, uh, the organizer team, and Etienne coming up in a couple of moments. So uh, this is going to be my part of my contribution to the event. I'm going to be uh, giving the talk called The Sacred Gift of Anger. Uh, you can get tickets at anarchadelphia.com. And uh, if you use promo code PASIO at checkout for the event, then um, you can get 5% off of your ticket sale. And then the Anarchadelphia organizers will actually match that 5% and donate it directly to What on Earth is Happening. So uh, go to anarchadelphia.com to get tickets, and uh, you could use promo code PASIO at checkout for a 5% discount. This is the title card of my presentation called The Sacred Gift of Anger. And I'll be giving this on September 14th, that's Saturday night, September 14th. After that, we will be screening um, the first ever documentary film that I ventured into making, 
And um, Carmen, again, was one of the uh, editors of the film. It's called Mark Passio and the Science of Natural Law. I'm going to cut away briefly and cue up the, um, the trailer. And we're going to play that for everyone here today. So let me get that queued up. And we can cut back over. All right, we're having audio. We're having an audio issue. All right, here we go. Not coming through. Okay, here we go. Apply to human behavior? Does our knowledge or ignorance of these laws impact our collective freedom as a species? This video will explore these questions in our current understanding of universal forces that affect the daily lives of each and every one of us. Natural law, I guess you could say just what almost like first instinct kind of? I'm not really sure. I'm actually a lawyer by training and education, so I'm probably the worst person to ask. Um, law applies to the whole country. Um, I think it means like how law is interpreted by people. Everyone was born nice and kind, but they are corrupted by society. That's natural law to me. So what actually is natural law? The definition of the word natural is inherent to and having a basis in reality and nature. In other words, not man-made. The definition of the word law is an existing condition that is both binding and immutable. Binding means having an effect that cannot be escaped. Immutable means unable to be changed by anything or anyone. Natural law, therefore, is a set of universal, non-man-made, binding, and unchangeable conditions which govern the behavioral consequence of beings with the capacity for holistic intelligence. Natural law governs the aggregate or collective free will behavioral choices of entire populations by manifesting the consequences of the behaviors that we choose. The consequences which we receive are always dependent upon whether our chosen behaviors are either moral or immoral, or in other words, right or wrong. So that's a very, so that's a very small clip of uh, the documentary. Really happy about the way it is turning out so far. I think it's going to make a big impact when it finally goes public and uh, I want to thank everybody who's been working tirelessly on it. So um, I think um, well, let's jump back into the slides briefly because I just want to uh, finish up with uh, what uh, I'm going to be taking part in. Um, so that's uh, the Science of Natural Law documentary coming up. Uh, show We're going to be showing the rough cut as part of uh, this great event, Anarchadelphia, and then uh, the Monday after the event, September 16th, an all-day workshop I'm hosting at Poppy's Italian Restaurant, 3120 South 20th Street in Philadelphia. It's going to be 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., an all-day workshop called Teaching Natural Law with Mark Passio. This is for potential teachers of natural law. I'm going to share some insight about how to go about doing this, some of the skill sets that's going to be involved. I'll be giving people per, uh, specific slides that they can use as part of teaching natural law if they want to do that in their own area. This workshop is $120 to attend, and again, tickets are available at anarchadelphia.com. So uh, that's all the, uh, the uh, event announcements regarding what I wanted to uh, show. Um, and uh, I think uh, now would be a good time to like uh, bring in our other uh, guests for this show and we could start uh, talking to them. Let's uh, let's cut over to Skype. Everybody, if you would unmute, please. I'll introduce everybody one at a time. We have uh, Anarchadelphia co-organizer, Pat Leach. Pat, welcome to What on Earth is Happening. What's up, Mark? 
we have uh, two speakers here with us today. Uh, Derek Bros. Derek, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Mark. Absolutely. And uh, another speaker for An Anarchadelphia 2019, Etienne de la Bouisi. Uh, have I pronounced that correctly? Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Great. Okay, so that is the correct pronunciation there then. Etienne de la Bouisi? Bouisi? Uh, yes. Okay. Square. Perfect. <laughs> So, uh, gentlemen, if you want to uh, start us off, just let us know what your basic role is going to be in uh, uh, at Anarchadelphia 2019 or how you helped uh, in any way to set up, promote the event, or how, how you're going to be taking part in it. Uh, sure, we'll start well, with Pat. Uh, uh, yeah, my name is Pat Leach. I'm part, uh, partners with Carmen and Sonny, co-organizer of Anarchadelphia. Mark, that trailer got me so amped. I am so ready <laughs> for that premiere. Um, you know, Thank you. I helped helped work on it. Shot shot the video. I remember we had to do it twice in your in your room, and then Carmen and I went out all over Rittenhouse Square and Temple and and shot it. Wow, it's looking really really good. Yeah, it's, so I think it's it's going to be really great when it all comes together and is finished and polished. And it's it's got it's off to a really awesome start. And I think people are going to be even impressed just by the rough cut. Uh, let alone we will refine it even after that uh, to get it into its final form. But it's looking awesome already. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. I'm really excited for a lot of the, the parties. Um, While well, you guys did a great job with explaining what's going on, if, you can just go to anarchadelphia.com and uh, get a little bit more detail. The schedule is there. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your seven-hour workshop, Teaching Natural Law, and uh, the, the, the documentary. Um, I mean, this thing is all finally coming together. We just have 11 days left. Uh, I've been working on this thing since, since the day we left Anarchapoco. We showed up at Anarchapoco sort of with a, a dream and a banner and some cameras and some sound gear. And we got the, the best response that we could have ever gotten. You know, thank you so much to all, all of our speakers, you know, Derek and Etienne. I mean, if it wasn't for you guys, this, this thing really wouldn't have happened, you know. So it's really just the support and everybody coming together and really making this thing happen. That's, it's just this dream is really coming alive. It's coming, coming to life. Pat, uh, that, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't really know what goes into conference organization. A lot of people have a lot of complaints, a lot of things, you know, that they, they you know, don't like about how certain things are done. But uh, those who haven't really done it don't really understand what it is to organize an event that is this large. Uh, before we even go to our other speakers, uh, I, I'd like you and Carmen to just talk about like what it's like to organize a conference of this magnitude because our listenership, I, I don't really think has an, an appreciation or really an understanding of that because very, very few people have ever done anything like that, let's be honest, okay? So just like, you know, you guys together, like just, Go back and forth a little bit talking about what it is what is it really like to organize a conference like this the first three months were excruciating there was <laughs> uh, very little time um you know this was redesigning doing a uh, uh, like a, a um, evolution of the brand like redesigning the brand um uh, establishing our business our financials uh just developing and designing the website uh, just getting involved with the network and pushing, doing a ton of promotional graphics and just contacting everybody and making it sort of like, I wouldn't want to say like fake it till you make it, but really get it out there enough to where people see that like we were really trying to do this and we really wanted to get people on board. And then, uh, you know, we've done this with virtually no sponsorship. You know, we've basically put out a bunch of graphics and content and onboarded everybody and got them to sort of agree and then the ticket sales just started to come in and they've steadily grown and allowed us to sort of finance this thing and make it happen. Yeah, this thing is entirely self-financed so far. We have a couple like small sponsorships, but as far as like what everything's been, everything that's been paid for and it's been booked has come from the support of the people who are coming together to attend this event, which I think is really cool. That's like the most grassroots thing I've ever been a part of. Yeah, I think when something stays small like that and grassroots, it stays more true to its original intent as well. So, you know, it's great that you guys were able to organize it like that with uh, just the, the, the funding and the help of the actual community that wants to see an event like this, you know, come together. And that's, that's an encouraging sign because it can be very, very difficult to get the resources for something like this. People don't understand how much things like this cost. It's in the 
tens, tens of, of thousands, thousands yeah. of dollars, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. You know, so when people like, you know, you know, talk about like, oh, it's, you know, could be done a lot better or this or that. It's like, you know, I, I heard criticism when I was in the early days of organizing for your mind. You know, you, you hear criticisms of a lot of events, but you have to realize people are going to have to just try to work and do the best that they can with the resources that they have, because it, it literally like trying to find a venue that will even host something like this and do it at any kind of a reasonable price. It's like uh, there was an event here in Philadelphia called, uh, you know, ending uh, racism, sexism and uh, authoritarianism. Uh, that took place, uh, it was supposed to happen in, in New Jersey, in Pittman, New Jersey, and they moved it last minute to uh, Sugar House Casino in <laughs> Philadelphia yesterday. And a couple of people I know attended, and um, they found out just what the price was for one day renting one room, one large ballroom at Sugar House Casino was $15,000. Now, and that's not including all of the other expenses to bring all the speakers, to lodge all the speakers, to print all the promotional materials, to make the website, et cetera. You're, you're looking probably easily at $30,000 for a one day event, you know? So this is a three day event that's, you know, it's starting off somewhat small like the original For Your Mind was, you know, and it's going to be at a, at a nice cater, catered ballroom type uh, venue. But it's like, you know, you're still probably coming close to around that much money for an event like this, at least, I would imagine. I, you don't have to share any of that data, but I'm just saying, like, people don't really understand what it is to do something like this. And when you do it out of your own pocket or with just with donations contributed, it can be very difficult and you often cut it right, very by the skin of your teeth, literally. OK, so, you know, I just want to first, you know, take that time with the organizers to make people understand, you know, you guys are putting skin in the game. You know, it's like this is what I ask people to do. This is what makes me happy when I see people doing, you know, get up, do something, organize something, do some kind of a, an outreach. You know, this is what why I get down. The reason I get down and the reason I feel like we're not making any any impact is because I see so few people actually doing something real in the real world, not just tapping away digitally on a keyboard, but trying to make an impact in the real world, bringing people together, helping people to network with each other and, and establish connections. We ha need that type of camaraderie and brotherhood and sisterhood. You know, it, this isn't just about, uh, you know, uh, digital transfer of information, you know, uh, we, we really do need physical real world events as well, in addition to, you know, uh, just putting information out over the Internet. I intend to continue with physical real world events. I think I'm going to continue them in the form of hosting just my own presentations locally, you know, someplace in, in Philadelphia at some point in the near future. This way I could work around my own schedule and finish a presentation and then deliver it instead of trying to finish it on a time frame in a, in, a, in a schedule like, you know, kind of like getting a book report done for, you know, your high school class or something. <laughs> so that's my vision for the future of live events of what I'm doing. And anybody can do things like that. You know, this is what t the Teaching Natural Law Workshop is going to be about. Hosting events in your area to teach people uh, about natural law and what it is, why it's so important, why we need to understand it as a society. So, you know, I just wanted to take that time with the organizers because um, it's so important to realize that this is such an important part of breaking through to people is giving a platform for speakers in the form of conferences like this. And uh, a lot more of that, I think, just generally needs to be done with people who are just coming up and, you know, uh, presenting their information. So uh, let's go over to our speakers and uh, get their take and let's have, have you guys talk about what, how you guys are going to contribute to Anarchadelphia 2019. So let's start out with Derek Bros. Uh, I guess just introduce yourself, tell people like your main website and, uh, and tell people how you're going to be participating in this year's Anarchadelphia. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, so Anarchadelphia sounds awesome. I think that um, before I get started on who I am, it does remind me of the early days of Free Your Mind, uh, <laughs> what I'm seeing so far, which is really cool. Uh, so my name is Derek Burrows, based in Houston, Texas. I run the website, theconsciousresistance.com, the YouTube channel, uh, the Conscious Resistance Network. And it's basically 
focused on exposing people to the realities of our world, uh, helping people understand their own self-ownership, their own self-empowerment on uh, a true spiritual plane, as well as confronting the physical institutions of power and exposing government corruption and corporate corruption and all these various systems and, and what they're really about. So I do that as a YouTuber, I do that as a journalist, both here in Houston and wherever else I can, doing articles and reports, video reports and interviews and things of that sort. And I regularly speak at various events, including Anarchadelphia. So I'm really excited to be a part of this. And Derek, what is your uh, talk going to be at, uh, at your main stage talk at Anarchadelphia going to be on? I'm, you know, I'm still kind of working that out, actually, Mark. But honestly, what you guys were just hitting on and what you were, your, your kind of closing thoughts there as far as having skin in the game and making an effort is, is pretty in line with where I think I'm going to be headed. I'm not sure exactly. There's a couple of ideas. Um, that I'm working with. But, you know, I've really just been putting in a lot more time focusing on Houston and where I'm, you know, where I've been my whole life. And my activism and my work is always focused on that, how I can affect my local community in addition to going and doing, say, national protests or coming to conferences in Philadelphia or wherever it may be or Anarcho Poco and things like that. But I've noticed what I see personally a very huge gap in the marketplace, if you will, of activists and, uh, you know, truth seekers who are actively engaged in their own community. There's a lot of people who are active online or have big YouTube channels and have, uh, you know, good ideas or maybe great work, but they also have no connection to their local community in any way, which I personally believe is a weak point for anybody who's trying to build long-term freedom and build uh, a movement of people who actually question government and question authority around us is, you know, I think the a goal, an important goal should be to actually try to have those conversations with the people closest to you so that you don't end up surrounded by a bunch of uh, status neighbors who have no understanding of, say, natural law or the things that are important to the listeners, and you haven't made any efforts to engage them. So I, I really have just put a lot of energy and time into that even more recently. So I think that part of my talk is going to center around that. You know, what what are people doing to actively move the their goal, you know, themselves closer to their goal, whether that goal means exposing the deep state or, you know, spiritual balance or whatever your goal may be, and that the reason that brings people to Anarchapoco and to Anarchadelphia and to, you know, your YouTube channel and my YouTube channel. I've been really pushing my audience recently to think and to question and ask, why are you coming to this content? You know, are you just here because you're obsessed with the conspiratainment, the infotainment, the addiction to YouTube and just keeping up with what the Epsteins are up to or what this groups are up to, or are you actually trying to achieve change and change yourself and change the world? So, yeah, I think my talk's going to kind of explore that concept a little deeper and, and really ask that question of the audience and everybody else there, including myself, and just thinking about what we are doing in any tangible way and what else we could do. And, of course, the answer is going to be different for everybody in their own circumstances, but at least to press that question and to put it towards our particular community and towards the community of people online who are looking for solutions and who are looking for answers to ask what are you doing? You know, what, what tangible steps have you taken to spread awareness? Derek, I love that idea for one overarching reason. People really seldom stop to think that the, the so-called bad people that are really ultimately doing this, okay, the people who are brainwashed, the people who are, you know, uh, just not, do not understand true objective morality, that end up going into the police force to control people, end up going into the military and taking orders to go and take natural resources from other uh, areas of the world and their people. You know, they are made up of people from our community. They're not like alien beings that, you know, aren't <laughs> human. You know, they're people that were raised by men and women in our local areas. That, and and, and yeah. this is what happens. They don't. They're never engaged on these ideas, you know, they think there's no other alternative for them and they go into these sick, depraved, you know, control freak, totalitarian institutions and, you know, offer their body, you know, uh, as a sacrifice up to, you know, these people in, in alleged power that, you know, and, and the cycle just continues and continues. It's like they're not coming from somewhere else. They're coming wow. from our people. This is what we have made as a community. You know, we need to look no further than in the mirror if we want to know what is ultimately creating the experience that we're receiving in the world. You know, it's yeah. we're doing this to ourselves. So it's like this is why more people have to speak out. 
They have to be willing to actually engage people where they're at. You know, the answer isn't running away. You know, I, I see this as a big thing. Everybody wants to leave, leave the city, go here, become an expatriate and go down and move to South America or wherever. It's like the answer is to make your community community better where you are at, you know, and so few people want to engage in that thing because, hey, they they honestly they'll look at people like me and say you want me to become as frustrated as this this person is you know i i admit it it's frustrating you 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 do this for this long and you see this little impact because what it's really about is people have to ultimately at some point stop being an attendee with an ass in the seat and be somebody who's actually doing something and get up off their ass and put skin in the game in this battle for freedom and actually engage other people you know it were it's yeah the, the the days of being just passive observers looking at things like they're taking place on a screen which we're all too familiar with you know with all the black mirrors in our home okay you know how many screens do you have do you stare into on a daily basis i know i stare into a ton of them I, one two three four <laughs> five six seven seven right in front of me right in this room <laughs> alone okay you know you know so it's it's like you know we have to start making that conversion from just being this passive observer to being an active participant. And I think that's what conferences can start to engage people, and especially when you talk to people directly there. I always get in conversations with people that say, I want to start, and I came here to hear you and g gain some inspiration from you. And it's like, how do I start? And I just say, you start from where you're at. Don't second guess yourself. If you know enough to even come to an event like this, you know enough to start talking about this material, you know. So, Derek, I, I want to thank you for that answer. And I want to come back to a very interesting dynamic about that that I'm going to particularly pose to both Carmen and Pat, but you guys can jump in on as well about this area where I'm from. And I'll come back to that. We'll do a roundtable on that in a moment. But let's go to uh, Etienne. Etienne, uh, uh, let people know about yourself, your website, any projects that you have done in the past, and what your role in Anarchadelphia 2019 is looking to be. Absolutely. So I am uh, Etienne de la Buissy Squared, which is a, uh, a pen name. Uh, my background is I'm a technology uh, entrepreneur. I've uh, I live outside. I used to live until very recently outside of Washington D.C. I was in Washington's largest uh, CEO networking group. Um, I've worked on Wall Street. I've uh, run a national third-party political campaign, and I've worked at one of the big four think tanks. And uh, and um, my thesis is so I'm an, I'm the founder of a startup public policy uh, organization called the Art of Liberty Foundation, and I'm the author of a book entitled Understanding Our Slavery. And in the book Understanding Our Slavery, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make uh, uh, my thesis is that government is not something that was designed to protect life, liberty, and property. Government was always designed from the beginning to rob and enslave the population. And as everyone on the call probably understands, uh, uh, if I don't have the ability to uh, take your money and call it taxes, if I don't have the ability personally to make up rules for you and call it laws, then you can't delegate rules that you do not have yourself to a representative or to a government. And so if the ability for the government to do all these things doesn't come from we the people, where does it come from? And so my thesis is it's been illegitimate from the beginning. And what I try and do with the book is not only do I expose the illegitimacy of government, but I'm exposing the role of the media in, um, in giving the population this false template that it's legitimate that you're old, that it's legitimate because we have this political ritual called an election and some people decide to vote for it that it is uh, that it that you are somehow now responsible for paying its taxes and obeying its laws and so uh so the the book breaks down the illegitimacy of government but it also breaks down the media system and i do it in visualizations i do it in infographics I do it in historical photographs um, in a way that has been designed to improve the number of people that will engage with any book because it's very picture rich. And also uh, because the majority of people are visual learners, uh, when, you, uh, when you see a visualization, you come to kind of a deeper understanding. And so you may or may not believe that there's six companies controlling hundreds and hundreds of subsidiaries to give you the kind of illusion of diversity of choice, 
But if I show you a media ownership chart, you're like, damn, there's six companies controlling hundreds of subsidiaries to, to give me the illusion of choice. And then you come to this kind of uh, this deeper insight. And so that's what I'm trying to do with the book. Um, uh, the book's been very successful. It's now in its third edition, fourth printing, and uh, it's been the best-selling book at uh, Anarcha, uh, Anarcha, um, Anarcha Polko for the past two years. And what I'm really, really excited about with Anarcha Delphia is that, that you know, anarchy has been really the best-kept secret of American politics because it's really the only, you know, it's the only quote unquote political solution that's fair for everybody. Nobody gets the ring of power, nobody gets to use violence or force on anybody else. And they've been hiding the fact that the world is this self-organizing place that produces spontaneous order and that absent monopoly government, you'd still have everything, the good things you want out of government, you'd still have police, it just wouldn't be monopoly police. And they would only be focused on protecting life, liberty, and property. They wouldn't be focused on SWAT teaming you for having a plant or for gambling or for some other victimless crime. They wouldn't be engaged in road piracy. And if they're rude to you, uh, then you fire them and you go and you, and you get another, uh, you know, another uh, security company that provides the you know the same uh, or better level of security that the, than the monopoly police are providing now, and so uh, so in the book what I'm trying to do is is share this message that uh, that uh, that we can have all of the things that people want from government that protect life liberty and property without the violence the war. The uh, the uh, for-profit prisons where you know people convicted for victimless crimes are forced to work for slave labor in these you know uh, for-profit prisons, and so I'm doing that in this like very very info-rich book. You can uh, download it for free at understandingourslavery.com, and uh, and my talk at an Arcapulco will be something along those lines. I'm still putting it together myself, uh, but uh, it'll be continuing to expose. You know, not just the illegitimacy of government, but media's role in showing how this small handful of old time media companies and a couple of dozen new media, Internet, social media and search companies are able to really weave this kind of control of perception by hiding the alternative voices uh, that are bringing this information to light. At the same time, they're amplifying the voices they are telling you that the system is legitimate and that you just ought to pay your taxes and vote harder even when we're being robbed wholesale from Washington, D.C. Etienne, I have a copy of your book both physically and digitally, and I have to say it's definitely one of the most uh, impressive efforts of our time talking about the illegitimacy of government uh, on its face. Uh, it's right up there with the most dangerous superstition, but I think it's done in a way that uh, just um, you know everyone can really just um, understand uh, and it's so visually rich as you said with a lot of great images in it that I think it's very visually appealing to people it doesn't really read like a textbook or a simple philosophy book uh, because it's very visually engaging so uh, I think you did a great job with that I just wanted to say thanks for putting that out there it really reminds me a lot of the science of natural law documentary because I'm talking a lot about that in that documentary where we explore that if you know someone does not possess the right to take a particular action because it causes harm to someone else or holds them in a state of duress that 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 a so-called right cannot be delegated or granted to any other individual or group and then magically turned into a right because it's a wrongdoing you can't delegate a wrong to someone else and magically turn it into a right by any process of mankind uh, that this is something that we explore in the science of natural law documentary and um, we uh, show how much people do not understand these dynamics. You have to see the result of the man on the street on interview <laughs> format that we did, men and women on the street, you know, interview format. And I think what it does is it visually highlights where the human work is to do. What is the great work? Well, <clears throat> we're, we're visually showing it in this documentary. We're showing how much people don't understand one thing that we're talking about, how much they get the wrong answers when it comes to it being asked questions about objective morality. You know, I mean, I see it every week on social media. I try not to even go on social media anymore because for me, all it is is a huge state of depression. 
where I just see where people are at, you know, and I, I gauge collectively where humanity is at in their understanding of morality. And it's horrifying, quite frankly. And this is something that I want to ask you guys individually before we get to uh, uh, asking about like this particular area, because I, I want to get to talking about where how, how, how you guys have engaged the local community regarding this conference, particularly to the organizers. One of the things I want to pose to everybody, including the speakers, is, you know, do you see people in mass or just, you know, in, in your communities gaining any kind of a wider uh, understanding of morality in general? Do, I, I don't even see people talking about the concept of morality, and when I do, I always hear the same thing, that it's subjective, it's up to us, it's different for everybody. R moral relativism seems to be completely running rampant, and no one, or v not no one, I, it's, I don't want to make that blanket statement, very, very, very few people in the freedom community, even grasp or understand that internally in their own mind as the biggest problem that exists on the face of the earth. They don't even understand how tied to the destruction of freedom the whole concept of moral relativism actually is. And that's not, that, that's like, that's the root of the tree of evil as far as I'm concerned. And so few researchers, speakers, uh, activists are even in, in talking about that and imbuing it into the discussion. You know, I want everybody to just speak to that for a moment and give me their take and perspective on that and see how do you see that playing out in your community, on your circles in social media, et cetera. So Carmen, you could jump in and do that first and we'll, we'll go through everybody else in order. Well, I relate to you, Mark, because I mean, the most immediate community that I've been trying to teach this to is my family, my like nuclear family. And you would think they would be the most, you know, I guess like open to, you know, maybe hearing something from their son. But there seems to be like this mind virus that is very, very difficult to get through. So my success has been found outside of the nuclear family and more of in like the contained community. Like, for example, an interesting thing that I'm excited for about Narcadelphia, how to address this problem is. At the, uh, at the skate competition after the show, it's going to be a lot of Narcadelphia attendees, but that competition has its own crowd, and there are a lot of, like, punk rockers. And I grew up in that scene. You know, I grew up skateboarding. You yeah, know. me too. Yeah, that's that's usually a lot of people's first introduction to it. But a lot of people get stuck there and don't ever, you know, kind of transcend into, like, the spiritual truths and the higher-level thinking that you kind of evolve into if you go down that path. And I think to have people like... Yeah, like like Etienne and Derek and all of our people kind of like mix and mesh with those people is going to be a great way to bring like this outside perspective into the local communities. A good example of somebody who's doing that, who, who's going to be there is Brandon Martin, the guy who yes. runs Skatopia. He's, um, he's pretty involved in doing that in his community over in Ohio. And it's going to be cool to see like people who um, might just be interested in, you know, tagging things with graffiti and, you know, smoking various plants to maybe consider that, hey, look, maybe this punk thing, like maybe there's more to it than just being pissed off. Maybe there's some sort of healing that needs to take place that I have to be a part of. Sure. And like a big thing in that community is nihilism. Yes. You know, just not caring about anything, just totally shedding care and saying, oh, the world's just doomed and I'm not even going to bother with anything doing one lifting one finger. Just let it go to hell. You know, yeah. that's huge in the whole punk rock community, especially here in Philadelphia. I see nihilistic tendencies all the time. Yeah. And then um, the other side of that is, you know, the people who don't go that route usually get sucked into the, uh, you know, sort of like the corporate materialist route, you know, whatever it is, just making a living and, you know, having a nice house for your family. And, you know, so your 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 family thinks you look cool and you're, you're like, you know, you're following along the little like life path. It's like the game of life. That's, you know what I mean? They want to fit into that. And what I think we're going to do at Anarchadelphia to draw in those types is the outdoor carnival is going to attract a lot of eye and foot traffic. And that's going to be free to attend. The, uh, the ticket holders will have access to the uh, inside area where all the juicy stuff's going down but we're going to be having a lot of people just coming through all these food trucks and stuff have their own audience like i mean even in the vegans there's like vegans don't understand the connection between you know what they promote and anarchism yeah. and how it's like essentially the same thing just applied to humans i was talking about this last week on the show how could vegans uh advocate entirely for freedom for for the animal kingdom but not extend that freedom 
to human beings exactly. and, and, and throw away the idea of the legitimacy of so-called authority. Exactly. And how could people in the freedom community who want anarchy not understand that we should extend that to the animal kingdom? Exactly. It's like, how could you want just certain beings to be free and not all <laughs> beings to be free? It's a, it's, a, it's a total act of cognitive dis dissonance, if you ask me. But it's like these are the communities that we have to bridge. You know, we, we have to act as liaisons and bridges between these communities because they they only have half the picture yeah. or, or even less than half. And there's a whole wider world of information that they have to open their minds to exploring. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, Anarchadelphia could help do that in some way or form. Yeah, that's the idea. These these trucks that we're bringing have a huge audiences that are from that visit them all the time in all the various locations. And usually it's just pop up flea markets, but this is going to be a little different because they're going to be waiting in line for like, you know, a banana ice cream whip and the guy behind them is going to start talking about the illegitimacy of government and then they might get into an interesting conversation right. and it'll open some paths, you know what I mean? Yeah, it should be an interesting dynamic. Yeah. So Pat, I'll let you uh continue with that discussion. I'll, you know, we're basically talking about like how do you see your community uh, when it comes to, or, or, or social circle, when it comes to understanding the concept of that moral relativism is the main problem and that we have to understand rights, you know, are, are objective, you know, and, and right and wrong is objective and we can't just delegate rights that we don't have. You know, uh, you know even in the freedom community, the idea of moral relativism is huge and I see it constantly. I, I, I was on a, a a liberty oriented page this past week where somebody was saying uh, who was a freedom advocate just saying oh all the vegans are talking about that they're they don't eat animals because they want to have respect for nature and then it had like a you know a bird devouring a, or lizard devouring a bird or something a, you know a bird devouring a worm I, I, I don't even remember exactly what the meme was but it said uh, and yet this is nature and it's like what that's trying to do, it's, it, it's trying to plant the mind virus, as Carmen said, of moral relativism. Because it's like, it, it's saying that we should somehow uh, have the, the, the moral sensibilities of the lower animal kingdom, of, of animals that just operate purely on instinct and don't have a higher reasoning function of the mind. You know, it, it's um, this is something that I constantly try to tell people the Satanists in all of the the rituals that I attended in all of the groups that I affiliated with throughout the years that I was involved in Satanism and the dark occult. One of the main things that they told me that they wanted to do above all else, which was one of the main pillars or tenets contained in the satanic bible was to get the human population to think of themselves as nothing but another animal uh, this is open conversation with high level satanists at actual events and rituals that i attended when i was a dark occultist in my past in my youth okay they said spoke openly about that they were going to convince the population that they are nothing but animals and should basically just choose to act like other animals. And really, I didn't have time to get into a wider conversation about it, but what I really should have went into is, well, I guess that means we should just walk down the street and rape anybody we want, because that's <laughs> what animals do. They don't ask if another animal wants to be their mate. They just go and have their way with them. So I guess we should just be just raping indiscriminately then, I guess. You know, I guess if you just don't like the look of someone and want to take their territory like animals do, you go and rip their throat out with your teeth. I guess that would be a perfectly acceptable behavior. Because if you're saying to just devour an animal like one animal will devour another, well then, by that rationale, I could just, boom, <laughs> blow Carmen's brain out here and then carve up his flesh and then just ch chaw away, right? It would be just perfectly fine and moral to do so because the animals do it. You know, all of these would be just existing rationales for just behaving however the fuck we want with absolutely, you know, no moral constraints whatsoever. So, you know, if that if people think of themselves as animals, why not take it out to its full logical conclusion and just absolutely be a beast of the field, you know? This is what Darwinism has done to humanity's brain. Yeah. It is a mind virus. This is Darwinism. This is social Darwinism. This is cultural Marxism. And this is ultimately 
it paves the way for radical totalitarian control freak behavior is really what it does because what it's saying is that the the animal kingdom as far as the, the animals who can't reason and think and don't have the capacity for a holistic intelligence like a human being, that we should just bind our behavior back to their way of being in the world, to their instinctive only behavior, right? Does, does that, is that what we are? We, we shouldn't aspire to be anything else than lower animals, right? Because see, they've bought Darwinism as a religion. And it's not a religion, it's a theory and a bad one at that. You know, and social Darwinism is the credo of Satanism. You know, that's what this ultimately is. It, it, uh, you, there's no other way to slice it except it's satanic thinking. And as Carmen said, I like the idea that this is a virus of the mind. It's a virus of thinking. It's literally like an infectious disease spreading through the population. That's what moral relativism is. So, Pat, I'll let you speak to that. For sure. So I would say that by the time I started to give back or raise awareness in my community, I had already destroyed my reputation with drugs and the legal system. So no one was really, like, willing to listen to me. So I turned to the Internet, and that's sort of where Luciferium came out of, this uh, animation about sacred geometry and spirit and fractal ma mathematics that essentially proves the opposite of what you were just saying, is that we're not just these animals. We are these godlike beings that sort of stem from this same source. And, um, and then it sort of evolved into Anarchadelphia, you know what I mean? I tried to start some meetups around here and Bitcoin meetups, but it's like one person came and then nobody came. I mean, I'm upstate New York and the Catskill Mountains and, uh, you know, nobody's really willing to listen. So, you know, I just decided to do this on a worldwide scale now. And, um, People are looking now. People are listening, you know, and that's why we're bringing people like you, you three, you know, some of the leading researchers in your fields to the cradle of liberty. What better spot for something like this? And, you know, I, I through those hard times, I had sort of become a drifter on uh, the festival concert scene. And there's there's sort of that nihilistic element uh, in the punk scene that you were talking about, where we just find ourselves in these drug-induced dazes where we um, find some sort of some sort of spiritual enlightenment, but it's like, you know, everybody is just all about the jam bands and the camping and what festival to go to next. So we've actually partnered with my buddy uh, from Glockwork Records, and we're throwing Anarcha work, and we're bringing in uh, some dubstep, some deep house. Uh, we're bringing in a really, like, well-known producer from Philly local and a lot of other big-name artists. And that's just another way to sort of draw in this um, on the fence type of crowd and uh, expand into this like punk rock skater scene and like the dubstep deep house grateful deadhead scene. Because we're all looking for this sort of utopian anarchy, you know, but there's just there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, confusion still. There's no the lack of direction. So uh, I'm get I'm in, I'm doing Anarchadelphia because you know, it's just the next level. This is just where it has come to. Great. You know, and uh, I, I think that's great bringing in some uh, m musical artistry into it because, you know, that lends the creative aspect to it. And, it, you know, that, that can help bridge uh, the philosophical understanding because a lot of people come at this from the creative aspect of the right brain, you know, uh, the right brain intelligence. And, you know, that, that helps bring it all together. You know, that, that helps, you know, people who really only do the verbal and the, the heavy research end of it to be able to, you know, unwind and get a little bit of uh, creativity into their mind, you know. And it also helps the people that, you know, are like that to come over and get some of the philosophy, you know, uh, from the music scene. You know, and w again, we need to bridge with that community. Yeah. Th these are people that have to get the philosophical aspect, the philosophical underpinnings of a true freedom oriented way of life, you know, because they have the general idea of that, but they don't know what the specifics are, you know, and then a lot of the people in the in the freedom community are extremely left brain. I mean, it's something that I'm actually going to talk about in my presentation that holds a lot of them back in their understanding. And, you know, they need that, that creative, uh, you know, expression and outlet, you know, uh, to be able to really um, integrate a lot of these ideas holistically. And, and uh, you know, that's a lot of 
uh, these type of events don't do that. You know, I know Free Mind Fest that was hosted by my friend Tim Smith attempted to do that with a lot of musical acts, mixing that in with, with lectures and things like that, and it went pretty well. So I know you guys are going to try to take that to the next level. Now, where are some of these, just as a brief aside, where are some of these music-related events going to be? Are they going to be held somewhere separate than Galdo's Catering? No, it's all, right at Galdo's. It's all at Galdo's. Galdo's. Yeah. Is that going to be at the end of the, the lectures? Yeah, each night, like Friday yeah. night is like a rap-based one to bring in people. So these are like after parties? Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. all right, great. And then, and yes, Friday night. night's a bunch of us, basically. Everybody within the community, Berwick, Derek might come out and spit some stuff. You want to tell them about the new rapper that we booked? That's going to be like a meet yeah, and greet yeah. on Friday, night, Friday mm -hmm. evening? Yeah. Okay. But we, we took a page out of your book. Pat, why don't you tell them? Yeah, yeah. Thank compliments to Leah. Uh, let me just pull up the graphic right now. Yeah, uh, Vinny from... Uh, what is it? Uh, power to the people. Yes. Power through people. Power through people. So stoked to have him yeah, come we just down. Got him on oh, he's Friday. a fantastic rapper. Yep. Yeah, he is excellent. So we have a lot of like internal family truth hip hop going on that night. So. D Bros awesome. might even take the mic from what I heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. We'll see. All right, so uh, <laughs> let's go over to Derek Bros regarding like you know your take on what you see uh, as far as your local community, your local social circle, whether it be you know in person or online, regarding getting the idea that moral relativism is the problem that really needs to be tackled, and you know where do you see people uh, in how do you see them engaging this? Uh, you know, I think that there definitely is probably a pretty pretty big dearth of people who are thinking on on those terms in you know in their average day uh, there's so many people who are just trapped in what we would consider the matrix or the rat race of just trying to survive every single day or they're trying to survive and so in any free time they have they're trying to distract themselves from whatever may be stressing them out or pressing on their you know on their on their neck or and so a lot of people don't even really go down those rabbit holes to start to question the power systems around them let alone why do these things happen and to look at morality and even those who I think, like you were saying, might believe that the concept of morality is something that's subjective. They might not even be consciously and like, cognizantly saying morality is subjective. They just sort of act in that manner. Um, but I, I do think that there is some hope and it probably comes in smaller forms and in ways that we don't always see that don't make viral videos and things of that because, you know, over the last Pretty much the last 10 or 11 months or like, I don't know how whatever long it's been since Anarchapoco and since the beginning of this year I've made a specific e effort and really kind of in a bigger way the last two years to get out of the bubble that is the truther community that is the uh, anarchist American anarchist community and that is you know the, some of the conspiracy research circles because I do think it is a bubble that we can put ourselves in that many of us put ourselves in especially when you do this on a pretty daily weekly basis of producing content you know, doing, uh, writing essays or books or, you know, putting graphics together, just being involved in this world in general. And then you get to a point, I know where I have been for years, where nearly everybody you know is somebody who's connected to that world in one way or another. And then you, we each have friends maybe outside of those bubbles that we exist in. Some people have no friends outside of those bubbles. But I realize the importance of spending time outside of the anarchist bubble is that we get to connect with normies, with the regular folk who are out there just living and breathing and trying to go about their business and I do try to approach it from some level of a compassionate understanding and, and from what I consider to be the, the you know the strategy of a bodhisattva that is somebody that is trying to lessen the suffering of all beings you know and, and going out there and communicating and working with them so on one hand I don't see a lot of people out there just having these conversations about more relativism or authority and, and what that means um, but I think that's the role that many of us have chosen to, to be in, to be the ones who come out there and have these conversations and to get these ideas out there and to ask people about this. And that's definitely something that I've tried to dedicate my time and energy to. And, uh, you know, uh, Carmen mentioned earlier that I am running for mayor of Houston. It's been a really interesting, it's kind of weird thing to do for me. But the reason I chose to do it is because of this, because I wanted to talk to people who aren't in this bubble. You know, the, being a part of this bubble, I have a certain crowd that's going to pay attention to the ideas. My take on moral relativism and natural law and, uh, you know, digging deep into these rabbit holes that I do on my YouTube channel. But that's still a part of that bubble, especially more and more censorship happening. The algorithms are just keeping people in their own little filter bubble. So we're not necessarily reaching and gaining new people constantly, but through entering this 
bullshit political system, not with the aspiration to be a politician, but to play their game and to talk about why self-ownership is important, to talk about why force is wrong, and then to use that to talk about things like mandatory vaccinations or surveillance or to talk about the control grid, to talk about 5G, to talk about all these different issues. Now I get to, to inject some truth into that world as well as hear from everyday regular people who, again, aren't going to come to these events and conferences as important as they are and find out what they think and, and as you guys said earlier, to meet them where they are. So, for example, this morning I spent two and a half hours with uh, some people who are supporting what I'm doing, trying to wake people up through this, and we went and block walked around a neighborhood just going door to door and passing out flyers about these ideas. You know, the campaign stuff, it doesn't have my face on it. It's not about me. It's about these ideas about, hey, we want to talk about this. We want to talk about this. We want to talk about this. And going door to door and talking to people and then hearing their concerns, hearing them say, okay, well, these sound interesting. And I'm also concerned that my house is going to flood. Or I'm also concerned that, you know, this little problem, these problems that seem insignificant in the bigger picture of like, holy crap, we got pedophiles running the world. But at the same time, these are these, these are these small things that keep people from being able to act. And, you know, if they're worried about their house is going to flood or why is my trash not being picked up or these silly kind of mundane things, they can't even get to the point of spending time on YouTube, dissecting these conversations and having that. So I'm trying to meet these people where they are by talking to the everyday normie and then at the same time say, hey, by the way, here's some bigger picture things going on. Maybe if we started coming together, we could question and challenge these things. So yeah, it's been an interesting strategy to try to hijack their signal for a little bit and to talk about real issues because I think that's where the people are at. The people who are already questioning natural law, they're watching this show or they're watching the archive. They're coming to Anarchadelphia. They're going to these conferences and festivals. And that's still necessary and important. But the, the vast majority of the world is still plugged into the matrix and is on that rat race and is doing their everyday normie things. And I think it's up to us or those who choose to be to go into that realm, to get out of our bubbles and to engage them where they are. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of my main areas of frustration personally at a personal level is that I think our community hasn't done an effective enough job in engaging the people around us in our community to understand the, the, the concept of illegitimacy of authority, to understand the concept that moral relativism is the problem. You know, that this is a mind virus, that this is a form of mind control to get people to accept that, to get people to believe in it. I talk about the, the four pillars or the table legs of Satanism upon which the entire platform of the dark occult is based. And that's egotism or pure selfishness as being the foundational aspiration for human life. Whatever I can get, you know, so, uh, let everybody else be damned as long as I get ahead. That's egotism. That's, you know, putting the self as, as the God in, in our world for all intents and purposes. Then moral relativism, the idea that there is no such thing as objective right and wrong. That human beings, based on their perceptions, can make up what right and wrong are. And then that leads to social Darwinism. The idea that the strong should rule the weak. And that's perfectly morally acceptable, you know, for people to just form a ruling class and then just rule uh, violently over others because they can do it because they have the physical prowess to do it or they have the weaponry to do it. And then that leads to the final conclusion and the final solution, which is eugenics. And that means that because they're their physical prowess and genes put them in that positions of power according to these elitists that they should decide who lives and who dies. That's eugenics. And that's what I call dysgenics because they're really not making the population gene pool any stronger. They're actually weakening it so that it can't ever rebel against their control. You know, so these are the pillars of Satanism. And yet the average person embodies them. The average person believes them in them and accepts them as foundational principles for their own lives. And I see this continually in just stepping outside my door. I don't, wouldn't need to leave any, go any further than this street that I live on to find probably almost every human being with the exception of very few believing in all of those tenets. De facto Satanists without even ever having heard the term Satanism because see people don't understand all Satanism is is egotism. That's all it is. It's just believing you're God. This is what they want. This is what they told me that they 
openly told me with absolutely total um, forthrightness and just being right out in the open said, we're going to turn the population into this. This is our religion, but we're giving it to them at a lower scale so that we can control them. Very outward and open about it, not trying to hide it whatsoever, at least amongst their own circles. And said, these are the things we're going to get people to accept as true, as just the way things are. And what I'm trying to get you guys to speak to is, I not only see this in the general dumb, completely unread, unresearched, television watching, fluoride water, toxic drinking, you know, uh, fast food eating population that has never cracked open a book one day in their miserable lives. But I see this in our community. Is That's what makes me, you know, enraged and sick to my stomach is that I see this in the community of so-called freedom advocates. I, I, see, I see these tenets espoused by freedom advocates thinking that's going to somehow bring them freedom. And when you say to them, no, moral relativism and only looking out for yourself is exactly what has created this problem. It's not what could ever lead to the solution of the problem. It's what created the problem to begin with. And it, it harkens to, you know, the quote from Einstein that no problem can ever be solved when you stay at the same level of consciousness that created the problem to begin with. But this is what I feel our own community of people in the freedom movement, the anarchist movement, whatever you want to call it, they are still themselves infected by many of these mind viruses, especially the moral relativism mind virus. And I see it over and over and over and over and over again in speaking with them personally, in, in, in looking at their online posts. They are radical left-brained atheists to a very large extent because they've thrown religion out and with the, the bathwater, they've thrown the baby right out of spirituality, of true spirituality, right out with the bathwater of, of, of religion. I say throw religion out. Who needs it? But you throw spirituality out with it and you're going to get a worse totalitarian regime than we already have. And this is what moral relativism is going to bring to the population of the planet. So, Etienne, I'll, I'll go to you next. What, what do you see on, in this regard, on this front, when it comes to moral relativism, particularly in our circles of people? Let's, for the moment, leave aside the unwashed masses, we understand how fucked their minds are. I mean, all of us understand where they're at. They're beyond mind virus. Their mind is literally liquid diarrhea. Okay. Okay. To just put it in, 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 you know, plain terms that are, that just accurately describes it. Okay. But you know, what, what do you have to say about my contention that our community is often just as quote unquote guilty in the creation of the continued shared human experience of slavery through the belief in moral relativism. So, I mean, I, I got to go back to where did, you know, whether it's our community or whether it's, you know, the kind of the average person in the street, you know, why do they have such poor morals? And the reason I believe, and, you know, from my research is that if you're, you know, like I said, if you're an intergenerational crime system and you're using government gubernari mente to you know to control the information that people receive um you don't you don't want the population to be moral and upstanding you you want the population to be dumbed down you want the population uh to be uh you know drugged up on opiates you want them listening to gangster rap you you don't want them reading you want them focused on the shiny flickering screen where you're able to use a variety of different psychological techniques to keep them you know watching the deception and the distraction and so uh you know the original etienne de la buisi uh who i took my pen name from when he wrote in the 16th century you know, he was pointing out the tools and the techniques that the that the monarchs, the organized crime of the time, used to create fealty and to create obedience in the population. 
and they op- they openly talked. You know, this is this is literally in the 1500s, and they openly talked about effeminizing the population by giving them, you know, games to play and taverns and brothels, and instead of you know garrisoning garrisoning troops. They would just give the population taverns, brothels, public games, bread and circuses. Um, And so that technique has continued throughout history. And so now uh, children are taken away from their parents. They're put into a mandatory government school that is a more completely moral free zone. You're never going to encounter real morality. Because if people had real morality, then they would understand that the things that the government is doing is evil and immoral and illegitimate. And so you have to control the information that the people get with these mandatory government schools. So you can, number one, ensure that they don't ever receive any morality. And number two, you can ensure that the template that they're given when they're very young at li- in, in life, so when they're, when they're children, when they're in middle school, uh, before they're old enough to question the morality of the system that is being promoted to them, they accept it without ever thinking twice about is it moral, is it legitimate, is it necessary, is it desirable to have a government. They're just given this template and they're saying, I pledge allegiance thousands and thousands of times before they even know you know, what they're pledging their allegiance to. And then you're controlling the, the information that they receive, not just with the mandatory government school, but you're controlling the information that, that they receive through the propaganda. And so every television show, the government is the hero, whether it's in CIA, FBI, ATF, that, that, that all the wars that we fought in are legitimate and we're always the hero. And it's OK when we murder people around the globe and it's OK when we go you know, out there, and because they're awash in this in this sea of propaganda, it really is you know the the equivalent of of a modern version of Plato's cave, where you know it's only a very very few amount of people that can you know can kind of escape the cave the cave, and have a understanding can go and train themselves because they realize the importance of understanding natural law, because they understand the importance of understanding morality, that they understand the importance of getting their own morality uh, 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 tight so that they're not harming the universe, so that karma does not come back to harm them. And so the, uh, so I'm, but I got to tell you, I'm actually seeing more and more people discussing the, these ideas. I'm seeing more and more, co- you know, these of conferences like, Anarchadelphia, Anarcho Vegas, uh, you know, popping up around the country. It really is kind of the fastest growing political movement on earth, and it's only going in one direction. And so I, I feel very, very kind of optimistic. And so when you ask, you know, what am I doing in my own local community? Uh, I just have recently moved. I was living outside of uh, Washington, D.C., in Northern Virginia, kind of on the tech quarter outside of D.C. And it really was like living outside of Mecca because statism is a religion and and it's very hard to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. And so what I've done is I've relocated to New Hampshire with something called the Free State Project. There are 24,000 plus libertarians, voluntarists and anarchists that are moving to New Hampshire where we can magnify our impact as activists, as community leaders as uh, you know, people in the you know in the community, to where uh, to where there's 5,000 people on the ground now. There's 24,000 that have pledged. More people arrive, you know, kind of every single week to New Hampshire. I'm in Florida right now, as you can as you can kind of tell, visiting some family and and picking up up an RV for an East Coast uh, uh, tour. But when I'm in New Hampshire, I'm amazed at the impact that I have in New Hampshire just by meeting the people that I do, whether it's at my yoga class or whether it's at a salsa class or whatever, but, but you know, being able to kind of have an impact that is disproportionately impactful than what I could have done in Northern Virginia with a much more kind of willing audience. And my thesis is, is that if we can win one state uh, and we can get one state to either you know, have political secession or have widespread Martin Luther King, Gandhi-esque civil disobedience where, where 10% of the population says, hey, we're not paying taxes, 
we're not withholding taxes for our employees. When police officers go to try and swap team, swap team people for a, you know a plant, people gather around them and laugh at them and point out that their heads are shaved and that they're order followers and what they're doing is immoral and they're wearing a costume and and uh, and I think that the I think the Achilles heel of statism globally is in New Hampshire, and I think we can win everywhere. But at first, I think we need to win somewhere, and right now that somewhere is New Hampshire. Yeah, the Free State Project is a very interesting endeavor, and uh, it's good to see that it's uh, kind of growing and uh, that you've gone up there to take part in it. So you'll have to keep us uh, up to date uh, as to the progress of that whole endeavor and how you Definitely. see it unfolding. Yes. Um, so one of the next questions I want to get into for everyone, and um, I'm going to particularly pose this to Carmen and Pat. Uh, Carmen lives in the city of Philadelphia. He lives only about less than two blocks away from me and uh, Pat lived here for a while uh, with Carmen and um, uh, one of the things I want to ask is how has the local reception uh, regarding Anarchadelphia been like just when tell us like how people reacted when you told people that you were having a conference about anarchy uh, the even maybe the venue uh, you know or uh, people that you've interacted with to do you know uh, any of the other ancillary things setting up the event um, or have you done like local promotion and reached out to the local community and and or done you know flyering pamphleting whatever like how have people from the local area of Philadelphia reacted to the event and the, the general philosophy of the event well there was there was basically two reactions um, I'll tell my favorite one first. We, we had a bunch of people just come out of the woodwork as volunteers. Like, we had people from different universities that were in the local area that knew about, you know, in Acapulco and stuff, but may have never gone there. And they just, like, straight reached out to us. Hey, can we help? Can we do yoga in the park? Can, we, can I be, like, your speaker volunteer? We had a woman who just came back from Honduras but was born and raised in South Philly, and she had us up, and she's going to be, like, a liaison to all the speakers. She's going to take care of so much. We have people, even from, like, the East Coast community coming down. Some of the people who worked at Red Pill are coming to, help us out too so we had a lot of grassroots help come in like we have people hitting me up hey do you want do you need me to be a driver do you need me to do this so that was really cool there are a lot of people helping and then there was the local targeting on facebook that, that, that i don't know what algorithms facebook's using to target people in philadelphia who are interested in anarchy cryptocurrency and occultism which is what we sent out there but all we got were communists commenting on the ad saying about how ridiculous the whole thing was and we actually had to recruit some of our speakers to go to the thread so it was mixed between people silently showing up to help in every ancillary capacity and i mean even you and your community just jumped right in. You know, we teamed up like it was nothing. So that was awesome. But then, yeah, some of the uh, more, I guess, traditionally educated <laughs> folks, uh, you know, it was met with much resistance. Like, you know, what are you, what are you guys doing? This is crazy. What are you, a bunch of conspiracy theorists? But that's to be expected. As far as the venue, the guy's a South Philly guy. Like, if he gets his money, he don't care. He was like, oh, that sounds cool. I, I want you to tell my listening audience, do I exaggerate even a bit when I tell people that Philadelphia is a communist-taken city? <laughs> Dude, it's ridiculous. Like, my street, I live up a small street, and for about, like, four decades, there's a sidewalk on the street that the only thing on the sidewalk is a fence to a gas station. And for four decades, people parked their cars who lived up the street on the sidewalk, and it wasn't a big deal. And then one day, <laughs> the communist government just said, you can't do that anymore, and it's going to cost you $50 a day to park on the sidewalk. And they literally robbed me of thousands of dollars at the threat of taking my car. To, to move it. So, I mean, that's just one example of that. And then, yeah, the mind virus. I mean, I went to Temple, and I was in an engineering school, so I didn't get a lot of the politics, but they make you take humanities and stuff like that, and it's all just straight out of, like, what Etienne talks about, about how it's just, like, socialism and mind control and collectivism and that whole thing to, to get people to basically support statism. Right. So, yeah, Philly's bad with that. I mean, I did a show about the socialist attitudes of people especially in the millennial generation, which you and Pat are members of. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, there, there were studies, political studies done where people of your generation were asked if they would rather live in a uh, socialist or even an outright communist regime. And over 60%, it was something like, it was almost 70, it was like yeah. oh, in the 60 percentile of people that responded, we would rather live in socialism or communism than have capitalism continue. Yet, 
when they were asked to define what socialism was, only about 20% of them could accurately define that socialism is a system by which the means of production and goods and resources are in the hands of the state and to be distributed as the state sees fit to the rest of the population. Uh, they could not actually give the definition that what socialism really is, is the state's control over the means of production and the distribution of goods and resources uh, and services. Uh, so, uh, Pat, I'll let you continue. Like, you lived in Philly for how long, approximately? Uh, probably three months, maybe three or four months at the end of the summer. Okay. Yeah, right, right there, right, right next to the gas station. Yeah, they'll, they'll take it, the shit out of you for anything, but they won't clean up the fucking trash around the cars or fix the potholes that you have to park over top of. So there, there are so many potholes in the city <laughs> from this past winter. I actually made a video. It's on our channel. One of them was on your road, too. I was skating to your house, and there was just a huge, there's a huge hole with, like, a cone in it. There's, like, three inches of the cone sticking out of the ground because the hole's that big. I know the hole like, you're talking <laughs> about. I know exactly. That's right on 10th got, Street, just before the corner of Carpenter Street. I know... I almost killed myself riding my bike down that street late, not seeing it, thinking it might just be a some type of a, uh, you know, a, a small water uh, pool or, you know, or a collection of water or, or some oil from a car. And it is a literal, like, multi-foot uh, deep hole that your whole front tire could go into. That could crack the axle of a car. It's so deep. And yet things like this will yeah. stay there for like six months in this city while they're raping people. Uh, and people are literally begging them to put two hour parking because the whole idea is they're appealing to the selfishness, right? They, the, the, I know the technique. I've actually spoken to people to pieces of trash that work for the Philadelphia Parking Authority, these low-life scumbags, okay? I've actually spoken and said they are open. Up. They will tell you, if you find the right person, how their management does it. They send people to appeal to people's selfishness. They go door-to-door -to, -door to find a useful fucking idiot dupe, and they appeal to their selfishness and say, all kinds of people are coming into your neighborhood that don't live here with their cars to park here to take the Broad Street subway. The, the, just ask people. You go to people and ask them, were you a hit with this idea that there's this whole big influx of people, of aliens from outside your neighborhood <laughs> coming here, and they're all going to park their cars on your streets so they can easy, more easily access the subway and then go to work in Center City on the subway. This is the lie that they literally go door to door to sell to people so people will go think th that never thought this thought ever before one day in their lives. All these people are coming here that don't belong in this neighborhood and they're all parking their cars here. And now that means we have less parking spots for our cars. This is what these scumbags do in government. Come in and plant these ideas in people's heads. But here's the thing. Are the people strong? Are they resistant to it? Or are they weaklings spiritually and mentally? and emotionally and do they just give into it and immediately jump right into selfishness mode and go go oh where are they at they're coming they're coming here and parking their cars here <laughs> that's how they get their agenda through by appealing to other scumbags selfishness because these people don't even stop to think they don't care about the rest of the community they don't even care about their own family members. I've said the people who voted for to have all these two hour parking and have to get a permit. What about your family that lives right over the bridge in New Jersey? They can't come here and park in your neighborhood now because you instituted two hour parking. And they go, oh, I didn't <laughs> think of that. Yeah, it's total no, because all There's you like are thinking about is right your so fucking okay. self. That's why. Because you're adhering to the first tenet of Satanism, which is pure selfishness. And this is what's really in the hearts of people. This is what's really deeply embedded in the hearts of human beings. They don't give a rat shit about anybody but themselves. That's what Satanism is. This is what Satanism is. And unless we're teaching that that's what Satanism is. See, the, the Satanists did a brilliant thing gentlemen they did a brilliant thing 
They called their religion Satanism in the modern world. And then you know what everybody goes? I'm not a Satanist. That's not me. I don't worship the devil. I don't worship Satan. I say that I worship the God of creation. So that can't possibly be my religion, right? No, because if they called the religion what it really was, then other people would know, oh, it's your religion, all right. It's nothing but your religion. Because what the religion should be called is selfishism. Mm. It's the religion of pure selfishness. And that's where most of all of our community is. Okay? I, I understand. You don't need to show me that again. Okay? So, I understand why they called it Satanism. Because they want people to believe it's something else when all we really need to do is explain what the real satanic religion is that all the masters of the world adhere to is the same religion that all the slaves at a lower level adhere to. And that's the religion of putting yourself first over everybody else and thinking you're the most important and fuck everybody else. Because that's exactly where most people's minds are at in this world without ever having done any selfless, selfless thing for anybody else. Okay? And that's what all these people in this city are. They are just purely embedded in the religion of selfishness, and they're, they'll listen to anybody trying to tell them, oh, somebody else is out to get you and take what's yours, and then they'll try to close off that resource and or hand it over to the state, which is exactly what they've done with all the public things that were once public in this city. It's all state controlled and that's called communism. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what communism is. That's what communism is. Okay? And that's what we have. So, you know, I, when people, when I say on the airwaves, Philadelphia is a communist taken city. And then I get emails saying, oh, Mark, that's an exaggeration. <laughs> that's, not, that's not really what Philadelphia is. Where's my vomit puppet when you need him? You know? Okay? That, that, hey, Mark, that, I want to jump in. I yeah, want to sure. really back you up. I, I, uh, I want, I want you guys to jump in about what, you, how you see this dynamic in your communities because that's all I see here. I don't see self, selfless people here. Okay, yes, the people who are already awake and aware, they came forward to say, yes, we'll, we'll come and, and contribute in some form to the conference. But how many out of a, 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 a metropolitan population of over 4 million souls. Yeah. 20? Yeah, a handful. <laughs> if I'm saying 50, am I going way too far? Yeah, I would say that's a bit okay. too much. Okay. <laughs> Th there you have it. So go ahead, Etienne, jump in on that dynamic. I'm particularly interested in hearing what it was like in D.C. versus what it's like in your new, uh, you know, home area of... of um, uh, New Hampshire, and then we'll go to Derek and talk about Derek. Your your current city is briefly Houston. You're in Houston, Texas, so that's got to be a pretty uh, socialist stronghold as well. But let's start with Etienne, and then move to Derek regarding your local areas in this dynamic. So that so uh, one of the things that I that I cover in the book, understanding our slavery, is I I point out that you know once the Indians, the American Indians, were conquered. The Indians had a had a magnificent, you know, good morality. They, uh, you know, they were in tune with their families. They were very family structured. They lived. They were, you know, they lived free. And after intergenerational organized crime, the government, quote unquote, government. After the government conquered the Indians, the first thing that the government did was take the Indian children segment them away from their parents so the parents would have a you know limited ability to provide moral instruction and and explain to them what's right they would put them in indian boarding schools running the prussian model of education and within a couple of years they took the once proud and free native americans and they turned them into taxpayers and order followers by segmenting them away from their parents and their family in mandatory Indian boarding schools. And so this is a program that's been going on for a very, very, very long time. Uh, in 1953, Bertrand Russell, writing in a book called On Science and Society, said through uh, diet, 
injections and injunctions, and injunctions is schooling, so we're going to put stuff in the food, we're going to put stuff in the vaccines, and we're going to school them up in these mandatory government schools, we will create a, a, you know, a population that will never rebel. And, you know, that was in 1953. And so if you take a look at the diet and the, you know, there is, you know, what are they putting in the food? They're putting recombinant bovine growth hormone in the dairy. They're putting aspartame in the sodas. They're using fluoridated water, fluoridated uh, water and beverages. They're using genetically modified organisms. They're using uh, uh, food coloring. They're using refined sugar. They're using glyphosate soaked wheat. What are they putting in the injections? They're using aluminum phosphate, aluminum hydroxide, mercury in the form of thimerosal, a gazillion different uh, uh, additives and adjuvants that have been proven to have neurological issues. And then what are they doing in the schools? They're giving more moral relativism and they're segmenting the kids away from their parents who would provide uh, instruction um, and they're withholding the trivium they're withholding they're they're not giving the kids the tools to to be able to analyze the information they receive and understand whether it's true or false so they're not giving them the basics of logic they're not giving them grammar they're not giving them rhetoric and so um this is you know i, I look at i look at the population as being you know as being uh um intellectually and morally crippled on purpose to make them more manageable and to make them easier to rob, control, and enslave. And it is a program, and it starts with the mandatory government school, and then there's a youth program where the kids get awards, Cub Scout Adventure Loops, Boy Scout merit badges for how to pay your taxes and 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 how to salute the flag and roll and the flag. But I mean, we gotta we gotta be honest that that they're running game on the population. They're 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 giving the population these artificial templates that say it's good to be a bad person. And until we expose that, until we expose it to the population, and the population goes oh. I didn't understand that there were a handful of companies controlling everything I see on television. I didn't understand. I never thought about the fact that they forced my kids to go to the government school. I never realized that there was a, a hidden curriculum in the government school system of obedience and statism. And, and until you, I really think that until we expose the playbook, explo expose the techniques, the hidden curriculum of the government school system, that we're just going to continue to churn out, you know, generation after generation of these sad, pathetic, uh, immoral, uh, fluoridated, vaccinated government school, corporate food eating, dumbed down muggles. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't show any signs of improvement, at least in my neck of the woods. Like, it, 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 as a matter of fact, the last decade has been a, an abject disaster as far as I'm concerned. Like, I would give anything to go back 10 years uh, in the past because it was so much better then than it is now that it's, I, I don't think people really can conceive of it if they don't really live in a metropolitan region to understand how fast the morality of the people is just in rapid descent. So, um, Derek, uh, I want you to speak to that dynamic and... You know, do you see it as any different in, in your area in Houston? Uh, what is the, the general, you know, uh, population's thoughts like when it comes to even exploring ideas such as anarchy and or just, you know, the concept of uh, objective morality and not uh, being, you know, violent or trying to impose one's will and be coercive or put people under duress or anything like that? Like. Are, are they open, receptive to that? Are they, you know, uh, just radically authoritarian there? Because here it's like just even speaking out against the state or telling people you're anti-government, you're looked at as a, a domestic terrorist practically. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, that, it's getting that bad in Philadelphia. Yeah, there might be some of those here in Houston as well. I mean, we're definitely promoted as, I wouldn't say it's, a, it's an accurate representation, but we're promoted as like a democratic city that votes democratic, but we're also still in Texas where people love their guns and where people want to be left alone. And, you know, the city of Houston itself has a lot of libertarianish, freedom-ish sort of traits about it, 
but it's by no mean a like you know bastion of freedom like for example there's there's no zoning regulations in the city there's no you know there's no state taxes there's some of these benefits of it right but it's still a place where people generally think that the instrument of government or the state uh, whether federal state or local level is something that should be used as a way to you know enact your vision of reality and so again like as participating in this like local political thing and getting to see how people think i do see like wow there's so many people that their first thought when there's a problem in the world is what can i do to get the government to solve the problem or well the government should do this or the government should do this so it's really exposing me to that mentality and also causing me to be more creative about how can I get these people to think about how can we take care of ourselves and what is morality, you know, is the government as an institution even uh, ethical, is it even practical, let alone effective, uh, and having those conversations with people because, you know, our, our campaign that we're running is basically all about getting the government out of the relationship. So again, it gives me an opportunity to say, well, maybe we don't need to use the government to take taxes from people to make that, you know, to solve this X, Y, Z problem that you have here. Maybe there's another way we could go about that, or maybe that whole institution shouldn't be involved in that way in the first place and have that bigger conversation. So, you know, I do think there's some folks who are open to it, but generally, just like any other major city, the people here in Houston, if they're engaged at all, if they're not just in that rat race trying to survive and trying to distract themselves or just get through, if they are politically engaged, they typically do see, and this is right, left, everything else, they seem to think that the government is the, the tool to make that happen. There are some libertarian-minded, anarchist-minded people here in the city, but of course, they're definitely in the minority of people. And then there are also the folks who, if they don't recognize the state, or they, you know, they, they might understand that the state isn't a valuable tool and that we shouldn't use it, but then there is a, a pretty good chunk of activists in the city of Houston who are left-leaning um, anarchists and who are a bit more extreme on, on their end, maybe the kind of people who were protesting or talking online about um, Anarchadelphia and why they didn't like it. We have some of those crowd, some of that crowd here in Houston too, some of those same kind of minded people. So, you know, it, I think it's everywhere, but again, I'm actually about to have to sign off, Mark, just for today, but I just sure. want to reiterate what I said earlier is that, you know, I think that it's up to us and I will be emphasizing this at Anarchadelphia. I'm also doing a workshop and, you know, lots of other fun things. I look forward to hearing your presentations, Mark, of course, and seeing the documentary. But I, if anything, I just want to reiterate that whatever steps you take, you know, even for myself to take something as what I would consider extreme to run for an office as, as a mayoral candidate, you don't have to do that. I understand the aversion to politics. I have that same aversion to politics. But whatever you do, whether it's just passing out flyers to your church community or to your neighborhood community or to whatever it may be, or say you have a kid getting involved in the PTA, the PTO, the sort of statist groups involved in the schools, it still gives you a way to interact with somebody that you might not typically come across. All of a sudden, you're talking to the neighbors and to the parents of, you know, the, the kids that you're your child is going to go associate with if you're in the state school system. And why not make an effort to communicate with them instead of just staying at home complaining, oh, all the kids at school are status, my kids got to be exposed to this. Well, there are a lot of people, and this is just real world stuff, there are a lot of people that I've met through this particular uh, adventure of mine and here in my community where I live in one of the poorest neighborhoods of Houston, uh, because it's just honestly the only place that will take a felon who doesn't have a lot of money. I meet people who are just trying to make it through another day, you know, and these people they, they might care about the things we talk about, but we need to be able to meet them where they're at, be able to see that, you know, not everybody's going to come to Anarchadelphia per se, or not everybody's going to watch, you know, our YouTube videos, but they're worth talking to. And those are the people that are in your communities that if you can't afford to homeschool or unschool or whatever your kids, you, they're going to be going to the state school system. So why not make an effort in some form or another to get to know those people. So as I said, go to a PTA meeting or PTO meeting or just go to a neighborhood meeting or just go door to door passing out flyers about this YouTube channel or whatever documentary you saw that excites you, just anything. Because we can't rely for one on social media because of censorship that is just increasing uh, more and more. But also there's something different that happens when you talk to somebody face to face. This is why we go to these conferences because we know that the power of connecting with each other face to face, it makes our movements that much stronger. So for the people out there who, if you can't make Anarchadelphia, then get involved in your own community, you know, and then maybe you end up making your own local events like we were talking about earlier, you get your own groups going or your own events happening, and that can help you where you're at because 
we can all come together for really beautiful events, but at the end of the day, we're still going back home to our own communities. And I think that's where we should really be putting our efforts and energy at. But thank you guys for the time today. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Dark. Thanks so much for being part of this conversation. Thank you. We'll see you at Anarchadelphia. All right, so uh, we're going to go to calls via Discord at about uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. So if people have any questions for our remaining guests, Carmen Karanji, Pat Leach, and Etienne de la Buisi, um, you can call in via Discord. The call-in link is uh, on the whatonearthishappening.com slash show page on the website. Um, we have about 20 minutes before that, so I want to get your take on this dynamic, gentlemen. Um, one of the things that I have been trying to do is uh, explain to people how deeply interconnected with the state the, the world of the occult is. That's been a mission statement of what on earth is happening practically since day one. You know, I told people on day one of doing this show that... Um, I had a background in the occult. I didn't really explore it until after I had covered a lot of information about consciousness and spirituality as a foundation for going into some of that darker material. And back then when I was first starting, I gave people a lot more leeway and taking a lot more time to get this dynamic. 12 years later, as many people can obviously see, my patience has worn thin and I've become rather an irritable human being when it comes to people's ignorance. Because if, if other people took 12 years of their lives to explain something at the expense of many other things that they could have done with that time, and the way that I've done it has been exceptional and extraordinary, if I may toot my own horn for a moment, okay? I did it in a very specific and meticulous pattern that made perfect sense, laid it out very meticulously and methodically with a, 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 a very enhanced sensibility for aesthetics, graphics, and people's, you know, stepwise progression of needing uh, material laid out in a certain fashion, okay? And I think I did it better than anybody in this entire movement, if I may say so. Not trying to brag, just saying that... Um, if, if I compared my work to everybody else's work, mine stands out, okay? Now, with that being said, the frustration that I am feeling is I don't feel that we're any closer to getting the population in any appreciable percentage or number to understand that this goes beyond politics, this goes beyond money, this goes beyond corporations, this goes beyond crooked judges. This goes beyond crooked police. That this goes to a priest class that is enthroned behind the scenes. And they have a religion. And part of their religion is giving a lower level of their religion to us. To believe in and then live and put into practice in the world. Now when I have attempted to explain this to particularly the freedom-oriented community, and particularly the so-called anarchist community or the so-called libertarian community, I've gotten more resistance from them than trying to explain it to a fucking bum on the street. <laughs> Straight up. Quite honestly. Okay? There are some of the people that don't want to hear it at all when it comes to the occult. You know? They want to hear this is all political and financial machinations that we could just clean up if we either stop participating in it or create a new system. But when you talk about mind control at a deep psychological level that has been practiced for millennia, not for decades, not for centuries, for thousands of years, then I'm not just a conspiracy theorist. I'm somebody who's radically making up wild stories just because they have no experience in that realm in their own lives. They've never spent one day in it and never will. They've never been tapped. They've never been asked to participate. They've never come across an opportunity to get involved in the world of the occult. 
But what if and when you do, and when you do talk to the people who have been involved in that world, you will realize there is something that sits enthroned behind the ostensible power structure. And our community, see, this is where my, really where I want to take this discussion. Our community does not understand what it needs to understand. And when I say our community, I really don't even want to include myself in that. Okay. It's the so-called anarchist or what I call the my freedom movement. I've called this the my freedom movement for about eight years now. Okay. Which should, is, is a derogatory name to label the, the so-called freedom movement because I don't believe we have a freedom movement and never have. I believe we have a community of people that want to believe what they want to believe regarding the world, but do not want to accept the world as it really is because they cannot expand their mind enough to understand that there are things that exist in the world that you have never participated in, that have never, you have never seen into the heart of because you've never been invited or asked to come into that community. And you may never, you may die in the state of never participating in a community like that. So what I want everybody here to speak to is where, where do you think this, do you see the same resistance that I see regarding this dynamic? Because I see it everywhere in this so-called community. I call it the my freedom community. Wrap them all in double quotes. Actually, to leave my out of the quotes, it's the my freedom community. Okay. So do you see that dynamic regarding occultism in general? Because I see it like they see this as some quaint little niche of religious belief that, oh, some just lunatics believe that or think that that's going on or that's real. And it's just part of the, an extension of religious beliefs and religiosity. They don't understand what occultism is. They don't understand who the occultists really are and how they work and operate. They think mind control is some, you know, non-existent thing or some illusion that people bring up or discuss and don't see actual social engineering mind control is actually taking place in the world. You know, and every time I try to explain these dynamics, it's like button heads with a fucking rhinoceros. <laughs> I mean, really, it really is. And it, again, it, 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 it really makes me think, why do I do this? I think this every day. I think of just quitting and shutting the fuck up every day. Okay. To be honest with you guys, right? Cause I want to make this more real, right? Just let's talk out on the real. Okay. I don't see this community getting it quite frankly. I don't think my contributions to this community are valued, wanted, or listened to, or even understood at all, quite frankly. So I want you to talk for the, I'm not going to even interrupt. You guys talk amongst yourself for the remaining 15 minutes until we go to calls on the dynamic of why is there such a resist? Do you see the resistance that I see to the understanding of the world of the occult? And why is it present in the so-called freedom community? Whoever wants to start, start. I see it. Absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. And, and just speak up a little bit right absolutely. into the mic. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. There is an absolute resistance to it. Anytime it's bought up, like you almost feel the energy of the room change. And I think it's because I think the biggest reason to be honest is because people are afraid of accepting that because what, of what it might mean. Yeah. You know what I mean? It there, they'd actually rather like, you know, sit amongst themselves and say, Oh, it's just some, you know, shitty politician screwing everything up <laughs> because that is easier for them to, to accept and to digest and to sleep at night. And I just want to comment on briefly because you, you've said this more than once to me in private about how you feel like it doesn't affect people. And the only thing that I can truly say is it affected me. And it helped me change my life for the better. Well, I'm, I'm not trying to say it doesn't help individuals. Mm -hmm. I very much understand you can make an impact in an individual's life. I feel I've made an impact in many individuals' lives. I, I think what I'm getting at is what I'm angered and frustrated by a lot is 
there's no appreciable difference in the understanding of what's taking place. Do you think that people really understand that Jeffrey Epstein is a member of dark, the dark occult and that he's working with occult, satanic organizations that sit enthroned behind the corridors of power and are allowed to operate with the rape and murder of children with impunity? People should watch the upcoming movie called The Hunt. Mm. Have you heard about this? No. Do you know what it's going to be about? Is it about Have them? you ever heard the mo about the most dangerous game? The most dangerous game is something that the satanic elitists actually play with people. They corridor off, they cordon off a huge swath of land that they own mm -hmm. that is often thickly forested. Okay? Or maybe an island. Yeah, or an island, okay? And they release people that they have kidnapped from wherever community they kidnapped them from, for whatever reason they've targeted them, mm. they put them in that area like game in a forest, Ugh. and then they go and hunt them. Ugh. Physically hunt them with rifles. Ugh. Okay? And obviously no one gets out alive because they may be given some rudimentary weapons mm. in, in some of the accounts of this happening that have, that have leaked out from, you know, within the world of the occult. Mm. But they essentially hunt them down to, to, to no one left alive, okay? And now there's a movie, a modern film coming out in I think a, a month or two, maybe even less than that, called The Hunt, that is gonna be about the, the most dangerous game. There's an old movie back from the 1930s. This is how long ago that this information came out that these elitists, that these satanic elitists do this. It, and it was called The Most Dangerous Game. It's a very old film. Mm. But uh, people should watch that one, and I'm very curious in seeing the new film, The Hunt. And if this is, is, is it, are people getting it? Do they think it's just a science fiction film, like a fantasy fiction film, I should say? Do they think it's just people making up things from the realm of their imagination? You know, Th this is stuff that art is imitating life, that they are trying to tell the story about that this actually goes on, and this does actually go on. This is how Dick Cheney uh, shot that individual that he shot. It yeah, was the Cheney? hunting thing. Yeah, what, what was the guy that had got, um, they said that they were hunting quail. Yeah. <laughs> no, that happened during the most dangerous game. Yeah. And he accidentally shot one of the participants that was tr supposed to be one of the hunters because he thought he was one of the prey. Ugh. That's what happened. <sighs> That's crazy. And he ended up with buckshot in his ass. You know? So... Like, do you see people understanding what they're seeing about Epstein? Do, do you think really you think, think they really grasp it? That level of blackmail, though. You know, I think you have to have some sort of incomprehensible experience to, like, realize that this type of shit is even possible. Like, have a lifelong indoctrination of Satanism and understand the back, the back end side of that or you know, have experience with DMT or something. So do, you something th just do, you think that, do you think that people would have to go into the occult to the extent that someone like myself has gone into it to ever possibly understand it? It cannot be explained? See, that's why I feel like, why bother? Uh, sometimes I feel like that is true. So why should I bother? Because I feel like it can't be communicated. That no one will accept it because it hasn't been their experience. And they'll never accept it unless it's their experience. Mm. This is part of the human dynamic of never-ending doubt. That you will doubt something until you are actually experiencing it yourself. And I don't think that learning has to happen only through gnosis. I don't accept that as a, as a principle of the exploration and, and, and actual taking into ourselves of fact. I don't think fact has to come in only through personal experience. You can know that something is true even if it didn't happen to you. I can know that there is water in this cup that will wet him if I pour it over <laughs> his head without having to do it. He can know that without having to have it poured over his head. Okay? You know? It's, but, but, but people are just in ego. They're stubborn. And like you said, they're in fear. They don't want to accept this is the world. And as long as we refuse to accept the world as it is, how can we possibly hope to change it from where we're at? The true. first step of changing anything is making a diagnosis and understanding where you're actually at in, in yeah. a place of health or in a, in a social condition. 
So I'm sorry for jumping in. I just wanted to say that I, I'm going to go. We're going to go like f at least five extra minutes and then we'll go to, go to calls. It's like 4.53. We'll go to like even 10 after 5 before we go to calls. I want you guys to explore this dynamic on your own. I'm, I'm going to stay out of it. Go ahead. All right, I want to jump in here because I think you made a bunch of good points and I want to address some of those. And I want to start with really defining the word occult, which really just means hidden. And so things have been occulted, they've been hidden from society. And I really think that the main thing that has been hidden from society is that there are technologies and techniques and ways of controlling society and I think that these techniques have been passed down through what I like to I, I like to use the word intergenerational organized crime because I think that that starting with you know Freemasonry behind you know even even you know going back past Freemasonry going to you know ancient Babylon there were techniques that were developed that were that allowed the ruling population to uh, uh, whether it's nutritionally cripple the population, whether it's intellectually cripple them with mandatory schools, uh, some portion of the population figured out that if we can control the information that people receive, then we can program the mind like a computer. And the way that we control the information that people receive is that we give them religions, whether that religion is... Catholicism, whether that religion is statism, whether that religion is Satanism, whether that religion is uh, um, Talmudic Judaism, whatever it is, if we can program the population by giving them a template that we're able to influence their decisions, and so... Uh, uh, um, if you can give somebody, if you can slip them the religion of statism as a child, they don't even realize that it's a religion, even though they're doing it, they're using all of the tools and the techniques of an unethically manipulative cult. And I think that that dynamic, that ability to hide the tools and the techniques and the playbook. I think that's been, you know, kind of the the kind of one of the key techniques. What I try and do in the book is make what was invisible visible. And so you mentioned Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein is a member of the Bilderberg Group. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. These are two of the organizations that I finger that I finger in the book as controlling the media and in the in the book I've got media ownership charts and I have uh, visualization showing how those two organizations the Council on Foreign Relations and, and Bilderberg have over the decades influence uh, you know have uh, maneuvered their membership into the key reporterships editorships publishers uh, uh, pre the presidency, the vice presidency, the joint chiefs of staff, the CIA, the DOD, the import export bank, the federal reserve system, going back in time through Republican democratic administrations. It doesn't matter going back decades and every single one of these major centers of power, you're going to find somebody in, from the Bilderberg Group or the Council on Foreign Relations. And so now when you put the pieces together and you see what Jeffrey Epstein was doing, so you see you've got a, a member of the exact same group running a blackmail operation, factory, factory automated, as many people as we can scoop up in our blackmail operation a year, uh, politicians, prominent individuals, and that you realize, hey, the reason that these people are in power is because they're willing to do the things that most people won't do, like run a blackmail operation on, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of politicians and prominent individuals. And so, been real quick. I know I said I wasn't going to, but just to highlight this fact, it's like people don't understand that that's how they operate, that they are bringing people to this island 
getting them involved in some type of sexual activity with children or even having children come close enough to them just so they can photograph them with children, making it even appear as if they're involved in sexual activity with them. Both of those things are going on. They're actually doing sex acts with them and they bring some people, photograph them in compromised positions with children so that they can get total compliance from these people when they're back in the regular world interacting. So they'll say, hey, you're going to vote the way we want you to vote on this issue. No, I'm not. Oh, no, you're not. Well, then tomorrow's newspaper is going to have the picture of you with the seven-year-old boy in between your legs. That's what's going to happen, you know, or, you know, it's going to have the picture of you uh, with uh, all of these uh, four-year-old girls all around you. You know, that's how these sick fucks operate and people don't understand it. They don't get that that's what this is all for. And they don't understand the other half of it is they're actually participating in murder rituals, torture rituals, you know, all kinds of sick, depraved rituals with these people. Looking at his island, seeing the types of buildings that are on it. Oh, you know, it's creepy. The, 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 and people going, oh, what, what is this? What kind of denomination of church is this? <laughs> it, it ain't no church, dumbass. You know, it's a satanic temple is what it is, where they conduct rituals with children. And people still don't grasp. They don't seem to be grasping what they're seeing. So go ahead. I'll let, let you continue. I just wanted to interject that. No, no, it's a, it's a great, Mark, it's a great point. And so what now, I, I think to, to your point, now that, what is what was invisible to a certain degree with Epstein has been made visible. And what I'm trying to do in the book is I'm trying to using the visualizations, you know, if you never realize that, you know, that these three organizations have their membership in all of these different key reporter and editorships at, at almost every major publication and uh, news network and paper of record and uh, uh, you know news service. Well, once you see a visualization uh, kind of connecting all the dots, all of a sudden you've made what was visible, uh, what was what was invisible, occulted. You've made it visible. If you didn't realize that they were using religious symbolism in their propaganda in the in uh, in understanding our slavery, I've got three dozen examples where, you know, they've got Bush in front of the cross or in front of Jesus or the or Clinton and Trump having halos and they're using all this religious iconography, but you never really notice it because they come by one at a time. But if I stack three dozen examples in front of you, then I've taken what was occulted and I've now made it visible. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make these connections that were previously invisible and occulted, I'm trying to make them visible in a way where people come to understanding very, very, uh, very quickly and to kind of a deeper understanding because they can see the connections for themselves. They can see the historical pattern. They can see that the United States is running the exact same playbook as the Nazis, the Soviets, and the East Germans. And because human beings are really, really good pattern recognition uh, machines, when they see that pattern, they're like, hey, wait a minute, that's, that's artificial. That's a, pa that's a playbook. They're, that's, they're, not, they're doing that on purpose. And so that's really, I think, I, you know, I think that, we can, uh, that we can expose it. The question becomes, how do you do it when the population is watching this propaganda system where they think they have that there's hundreds and hundreds of different companies and organizations that are providing them their news and they and and surely if if there was if organized crime was really running things then it would be on one of these channels and so once you realize that it's not hundreds and hundreds of different it's just this small handful of companies operating as a cartel controlling every screen and deceiving every audience well, once you see it for yourself, then it's a lot harder for them to fool you again. Once you realize there's a man behind the curtain, it's a lot, e it's a lot harder for him to fool you again. And so uh, how do you do it in a, in a situation where they're controlling every screen and deceiving every audience? Uh, the, in addition to the book, I've got a little uh, flash drive. It's called a wafer drive. It's a credit card size, eight gig flash drive 
that has the book and uh, 8 gig of, of, of evidence of government criminality. And I think that we have to go door to door. And so one of the projects that I'm working on is we call it the Pre-State Project. But, uh, but let's take the book, physical copies of the book, physical flash drives, physical uh, DVDs of Vaxxed, and let's distribute 100,000 in New Hampshire and let's wake up. Let's really widely expose. Let's get around the censorship. The only we're never gonna. You're never gonna be able to cut through the censorship on the DARPA internet. You're never going to be able to cut through the censorship on the mainstream media. You're never going to uh, be able to change the algorithmic manipulation that Google is involved in. So you have to go door to door. You've got to physically distribute. Uh, you've got to physically get this information into people's hands so that they get around the algorithmic uh, 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 censorship of of Google and search engines. And so, so I think that that it's got to be door to door. It's got to be hand to hand. And so, uh, and, and our Liberator flash drive, we make it so anybody can download a Liberator. Anybody can 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 print out the 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 label and wrap a USB drive of their own and hand their uh, their um, uh, neighbor a flash drive that is going to have these media ownership charts, that's going to have these visualizations showing how these organizations that produce Jeffrey Epstein are controlling all of the levers of power from the media to the presidency, to the vice presidency, to the CIA, NSA, Joint Chiefs of Staff, FBI, Federal Reserve System, but you've really got to see it with your own eyes to believe it. And you've got to get around the censorship to be able to put it in front of people so that they can see it with their own eyes. That's a good idea to do that digitally with a small flash drive. That makes it easily, um, you know, uh, shareable. You know, people can copy it and uh, share it easily. So great idea uh, to do it like that. So, Pat, um, we have about five minutes before we're going to go to calls. I'll let you speak to the dynamic of uh, do you agree with my contention that the um, so-called freedom movement uh, is very, very um, uh, uh, resistant to the idea of understanding the occult forces that we are up against? And uh, if so, how, why do you think that is? And how, do, how can you possibly see, what do you see that we might be able to do to put a dent in that dynamic? See, it's just so complex that I think people are almost unwilling to just absorb it all. I went and I looked at, I looked up Epstein Island, uh, that temple just now, and I also found this huge sundial. And, um, you know, that brings to my attention the stars and the understanding how to harness astrology and the procession of the equinoxes and its relation with time and nature and the kingdom of God being within and how to use this energy to your power. And I think that's potentially what these sick fucks are doing. And uh, as far as like us, like we... like you said, this is uh, like Howard said, this is being this information is being passed down through generations of criminals and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's just so much to wrap your head around. And I think we all sort of dive into one little specific area and focus on it, and then everybody's focused on that. But it's just so widespread that it's just like almost incomprehensible. So as like saying before, you almost need some incomprehensible experience to sort of open your mind up and up to realizing that, you know, this is all a facade it is all made up it is all controlled by some really sick fucks and i don't know and that's why i'm doing anarchadelphia i'm just trying to bring people together to, to further talk about this shit right. and further expose it you know but i mean i don't know what the fuck is going on but um it's definitely something man yeah so I'll, 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 I mean, I'll, 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 I'll wrap up this segment before we go to calls with just saying that i feel what the most important topics to get across to the freedom community in the modern world are are the understanding of the realm of the occult what occultism is why they are hiding this information as etienne was just referring to and understanding that the, the, how what the state of mind that they want to keep the population in is this is what people don't yet understand. They don't understand who the occultists are. They don't understand what their belief system is. They don't understand what the whole realm of the occult is, the information that it contains, why it's important to understand it. And they most certainly don't understand natural law as a body of laws that operate within the realm of the occult because they are unseen, non-physical laws 
that ultimately then percolate into the physical domain because they are about the consequences of the behaviors that we choose. And people don't understand in the freedom movement to a very large extent how moral relativism is the absolute murdering force within this community. It is the dynamic that is completely and utterly annihilating human freedom more than any other. And I think that, that we really should try to take up the mantle of explaining these things to this community because they're very, very reticent and even outright resistant toward accepting that these things are true. And we're not going to make any headway until we get people within this community to uh, grasp these concepts and understand why we need to understand the world of the occult and why we need to understand that to embrace moral relativism is to embrace slavery. Yeah. And that's okay. why we were very deliberate in putting occultism as a tag for anarchadelphia. Yes. We're, I'm sick of it too. I'm sick of like people staying just in the political realm or even right. just in the cryptocurrency realm. We want that to be very deliberate. So if anyone out there, you know, thinks this is important and wants to support us, I mean, like I said, we're doing this without sponsors, but this is something that like the whole world has to come together to to contribute to. So if you want to contribute in any way, as far as like volunteering, getting involved, sponsorship, shoot an email to tsoa at the state of anarchy com because we need everybody to come together. At as one to overcome what is a very powerful and ancient force that holds us in bondage. That's right. Let's put that email up there. It was uh, tsoa at thestateofanarchy.com. So if you want to get involved with uh, helping them with their mission statement of exposing this within the freedom community, that's why I decided to take part in this conference, because you were including that aspect. You know, and that my contribution regarding the world of the occult is going to come in the form of my workshop. You know, I'm going to talk about a human social dynamic more than anything else in my main lecture regarding anger and why it's needed and why it's suppressed. There's going to be some information about social engineering there, which ties in with the occult, but largely that's going to be about the, the social dynamic and the cultural programming of the suppression of anger, why the powers that shouldn't be, you know, are doing this uh, and trying to uh, repress anger within all of us. So uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to ask our hosts to mute up on Skype and then I'm going to unmute you in Discord so we can prepare to take calls in Discord. Okay, so just mute up on Skype and then uh, I'm going to switch over to Discord. Okay, and I'm going to unmute myself in. I'm going to unmute myself in Discord. We have some people on the line for calls. I'm going to unmute now my guests on Discord. So just give me a moment to do that. All right. All right, gentlemen, just uh, give me some audio to make sure that we do have you on Discord. Binary drool. Okay. Etienne, you have to unmute your mic on Discord. All right, Etienne uh, can't hear me. Uh, let me... Let me, or maybe you can, I'm not sure. Etienne, you have to Etienne. unmute your mic on Discord. Because you're unmuted at the server level, so just unmute in the app. Can you hear me? There Testing. you go, there you go, great. All right, so we're good to go. Uh, let's go to the phone line. Hello, hello. Yes, we're hearing you. All right, so let's go to APOX. APOX, you're live on What on Earth is Happening with our guests, Carmen Karanji, Pat Leach, and Etienne de la Bouissi. Hi, Mark. How's it going? I'm doing okay. Thanks yeah, for calling in. Of, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it was nice to get a um, variety of people uh, on the show today. Um, I think you guys brought up some good topics. I have some good points that I've been thinking about, and I think it would be good to get you know, I'd like your opinion and also everyone else's as well in the in the call. Sure, go right ahead. Okay, so you know you're talking about um, um, what pe the what people have to do to be able to to get back to first principles on uh, on different uh, yeah to be able to get back on first principles like the fact that morality is objective that there is you know that there's a spiritual realm and 
there's more than just material. Yes. So along those lines, I was thinking of the, the motivations behind people, like for what they do and their belief systems. I find that um, many people, like you know, when they um, they're motivated by, like when they do things in life or when they try to join certain groups or their careers or their relationship, I find that they're they're a lot of people if they're not mentally strong enough, they are um, they're driven by a sense of belonging, rather than this you know than this independent mentality that you need, and I feel like you need a certain strength and you need a certain mental um, toughness to be able to think outside of the system, and I was thinking. To be able to break through to people, how do we how do we reach people like that, without them having go without them having been through something like you know incomprehensible, like Pat was saying, or through something really traumatic, or going through the occult like yourself? What is it that we need to break through to these people so that they can see, and they can uh, become strong enough mentally so they can stand on their own and not, you know, not try to join groups out of uh, belonging? It does really seem that way, doesn't it? Like that. The people who are really going to really go the furthest in their understanding have been toughened. They have been tempered almost as if it's like a, a sword being being forged, you know, in heat and hammering. You know, it's like people who haven't suffered and been through a lot of, you know, trauma and suffering uh, really don't seem to really get it at a deep level. Only the people who have experienced that and come through it. So who would like to speak to that dynamic? Like what can we do possibly to reach people on a term other than them having to go through such a ne negative experience? Because it seems like that's what we're choosing on a mass scale. It's like on a mass scale, the whole population of the planet is saying, we're not gonna learn this lesson until we get beaten and forged in fire like a sword. You know, then you know we'll come out on the other end a little bit sharper. But it's like we're begging for that negative experience. We're begging for what I call the way of maximum pain, which is not necessary. There are spiritualists all over the world that give people the, bull, the new age bullshit that, oh, no, nothing good can ever come without that happening. It's a big crock of shit. Of course you can learn. Again, this is what I want to make a, a, a focal point of my work in the future. You can fully learn and become fully enlightened without having to go toward the most negative experience. It doesn't mean that you don't suffer at all, but it doesn't mean that, you know what? I don't believe that fire's hot, so let's just burn all the fucking flesh off this hand down to the bone to prove it. Like, I don't need to do that to learn fire is hot, you know? Like, we have to stop being so just ridiculous in, in, in certain forms of extremity. You know, so like, let's let's go to the caller's question and I'll let you guys return, you know, uh, uh, respond in, in, in turn. Is there anything that can be done to try to get this understanding to people without them having to go through the way of maximum pain, so to speak? Potentially removing emotion. So I sent two images of Epstein's Island to the chat. And if you look at the top of the temple, you can clearly see that there are hieroglyphs on the patio. And it is clearly um, like fractal frequency of expansion. So mathematics for me was allowed allowed me to look into this stuff deeper and remove emotion because mathematics is objective is morally objective. You, there is no emotions. There is no subjective answers to mathematics. So when you follow this fractal mathematics to the center, for at least for myself, I realize that I am that source, and everyone is that source. And they don't teach us about this stuff in public school. They don't teach us about Fibonacci or the golden ratio or how fractal mathematics is the framework of all or the entire organic realm. And it must stem from something spiritual. And then you look at all of the, like you said, um, Antiene, there's uh, uh, six corporations that rule everything. And all of their symbolism is the epitome of spiritual fractal mathematics, whether it's a car symbol, whether it's on food, whether it's a football team, no matter what it is. So they're just hiding the stuff in plain sight and they're pushing it right in front of your face. And as long as you see it and you accept it as something else, you're like internally digesting that and adding that to your sort of like quiver, but those those are dull arrows. You know what I'm saying? They're never gonna do anything. So I felt like moving the emotion, starting from the center, mathematics helped me. 
and it opened my mind up a lot of things. One of the things I heard the caller say was that a lot of the trouble that he finds is that the people who are, you know, I guess okay with being in the cult of mediocrity or the cult of the ignorant is that they find a sense of belonging because that's what I feel like a lot of us are looking for in general. And I would say the only way to really offer them something to get them to open their mind to something else would be to, to essentially give them somewhere else to belong somewhere, somewhere else that's more true to the heart. And the only way to do that, in my opinion, is to lead by example. Like I know the people that I've managed to change or, or get their minds to be open to these new things. It isn't because I've proven anything to them. It's because I, they felt that like they could trust me. They could trust what I was saying because they felt that it came from a place of compassion and that that place of compassion seemed more belonging to them than whatever, you know, rigid social structure they got thrown into. So I think we have to offer people something benevolent in the face of all of this dark stuff as far as like, hey, look, this might be a hard thing for us to, to comprehend and to accept. But we're in this together we're the, by the very nature that you're willing to explore this with me and I'm willing to explore this with you and face it in courage and bravery that might give them a new place to belong. That's my two cents. I think that's definitely the right approach. I, uh, the only problem or issue with it is there's so few people that do have any understanding of this that the idea of we're only going to do it by leading fr by example, how many people could we possibly influence? Mm. It's like we only have a certain reach within, within our own communities and, and lives. And it's just, I feel like it's such a paltry number compared to the overwhelming hordes of ignorance so outnumber the, the human population, uh, the, the, the awake population, that it, it, I get discouraged because I see like, even if I went out and attempted that, what, what are the odds that I could do it with even three or four people in the course of a, a week or a month? What impact is that going to have unless they're all also become as influent in as much of an influencer? It's like the, the chances of building that and making it become a dynamically expanding exponential pattern seem slim at this point if it hasn't happened already. I'm not well, saying that to be discouraging. I'm just saying that I just see like like I, I thought that that was going to happen over a decade ago in my naivete regarding how uh, moral people were and how they would respond well to truth. And then when I saw it com not only completely be rejected, but the dynamic went in 180 degrees in the opposite direction where people quadrupled and tenfolded down in their position on government and authoritarianism. Like I'm, I'm discouraged to the point where I, I'm discouraged more than what I told people. I told people not to get discouraged. And like I went way beyond their former level of discouragement, seeing where human beings are at. Like, I think I just looked too deeply into the average human heart and saw how black pitted like coal it was. I, I don't know whether... I, again, I think your idea is very well intentioned and good hearted, Carmen, and I don't want to dissuade you from that course of action. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I have to be honest about what I think, mm -hmm. right? So I feel like I did try to do that with people. And basically what I found was that they literally do not care about the truth or freedom mm -hmm. and that they are, that they find the world perfectly acceptable in the slavery that it is in don't care to understand why it's wrong, don't want to do anything except selfishly live their lives. Because I think once Satanism has a person at that level of control, they're gotten. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether people, in other words, maybe they went deeper into Satanism than I ever did. <sighs> That's what I've really come to start to think by having looked at the human condition as deeply as I have. I don't think I was ever much of a Satanist as black hearted and deep into Satanism as I went. It was negligible to how satanic my neighbors on this very street are mm. or in on other blocks in this community or in this city or in this nation. I, I just think they m made 
and past tense, present tense, and future tense, they were, are, and will be better Satanists than I ever were, than I ever was. And that's the problem. They don't even know how deeply into the satanic mindset they have gone and are currently in. They don't understand that. They think it's just life as normal, business as usual, and they don't understand any aspect of what Satanism actually is, let alone how deeply ensconced in it they are in their own personal mindset. And that's what, why I'm, I have been increasingly more and more discouraged in, in even attempting to continue this. I don't, I don't, you know, the, the capacity that I'm going to do this, I'm still going to do the show, but I am really going to largely back away from a lot of aspects of this because of where I see people's minds and hearts. I don't see them open. I see them 100 folding down, forget doubling down. Their, their trip, their, their hearts are being hardened 100 times over. As I see it, I don't see anybody opening up their minds in this, especially in this area. Like I feel like if I don't, I, I feel like I have to some at some point leave this city or I'm going to go completely mad. This city is a like molten lava pit of just absolute sick darkness of the human mind and heart. Be, and that's because they know where they have to inject the satanic energy. Uh, like, as, as Ross Ben, who was one of the speakers in the early Free Your Mind days, said, what is done in Philadelphia is done with the full consent and, and approval of the earth. The earth spirit itself takes the energy that is present in Philadelphia and scatters it throughout the rest of the, the whole planet. It's it's a it's an injection point. Like if you inject into a vein, it'll t carry the 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 thing that you're injecting throughout the body. Philadelphia is like an injection point for the earth. Literally, this is this has been discovered and talked about in geomancy. It's it's a very well known thing that Philadelphia is one of the power centers of the earth as far as etheric energy is concerned. And the world I, itself has phi in it twice. F H I, which is Fibonacci. Right. Cultivation. Right. So and you know, this is this is a, a center where the occultists knew they had to take it so deeply, so completely, that all of that black energy would be sent out through the rest of the world. You know, because that's why the whole mound system is here, you know, the the ancient mound system of the the, the ley line systems all converge here in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. What they called the dragon paths or the ley lines. Yeah. This is a deep energy you know, um, uh, it's a, it's a conduit center. Yeah. It's a coming together of conduits of energy and they understood this geomancy and that's why they had to take this place so completely and boy, have they, I mean, it is, it's, I mean, when people come, you'll see, I, I hope you see when you come for Anarchadelphia. I want you to see. I, I don't want you to just go, you shouldn't come here and just enter. That's one of the things I'm gonna suggest for people who are coming to this conference. Don't just come here and only interact with the choir. Please, you will be missing the experience. You will be missing the totality of what you could have as an experience in coming to the city of Philadelphia if you're not from here. Um, if somebody, whoever is, if we can mute the interface sounds, I don't know where that's coming from, but let's try to do that. It's probably in somebody else's uh, Discord. I'm sorry for that oversight. We didn't go through every single setting. So it's just what it is. Anyway, I think my advice to people coming to Philadelphia is attempt to vet what I'm saying and understand I'm not making it up or exaggerating it. Okay? Anybody who's really awake and aware and who has been here for any appreciable amount of time will show you and will tell you personally that I'm not exaggerating what I'm saying. Okay. And it's why it's hard to be from here, to live here, to just be, it doesn't matter how strong you are. After a certain amount of time, it wears upon you. It wears upon you. And see, this is what I have to understand that I ask other people to be as strong as I have been. And now yet I absolutely fully 100% admit to everybody out there. I'm my armor is weakening. My shields are weakening. They're taking hits. 
because of how much darkness and blackness and soul-sucking Satanism is here in Philadelphia. It's a yeah, sick satanic center of the earth. You're not kidding, man. Three months, three, four months was all I could take. And, and then, I mean, I, I, I admit I'm one of those guys who flies down south for the winter. But you know what? Doing that the past couple of years has, has made me want to get more involved up here in my community. Right, right. I've lived here for the whole 45 years of my life, Pat. And let me tell you something. I would give, I would give up my life to have the city return to how it was 20 years ago. Even I'd take a decade ago. That's how wretched it has become, this place. It is a sick, wretched place of Satanism and communism. Mos Eisley has nothing on the city of Philadelphia. <laughs> Believe me. Mark, you will never find gotta... a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Yeah. Hey, so go hey, ahead. You uh, Etienne, you, you, you uh, yeah, speak to you. the caller's okay. dy dynamic. Uh, go, go right ahead. Yeah, that's why we got to get you up to New Hampshire, because I, I feel like... Philadelphia is uh, is bringing you down uh, way <laughs> way too. I feel like uh, like you you would be pumped up. Maybe it's the other that. way around. Maybe everybody needs to come here yeah, and build a sure. community in the place where the energy is actually scattered to the rest of the world. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I want to take advantage of this uh, geomancy stuff. But I, I also well, like the idea of the Free State Project of them all coming together and bringing uh, you know people. Of a of a freedom oriented mindset in, into one place, you know. It, but yeah, Philadelphia is definitely it is it is having a negative impact. I, 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 I have a uh, the the I have very mixed feelings about moving because I consider that running, and it's just not in my nature. It's like I, I feel like I just have to somehow weather it, but I don't feel like other people really appreciate it. That's why I want to say. When people come to the conference, interact with the community in, in the city. Go into Center City and interact with people. Go into South Philadelphia and interact with people. Go into West Philadelphia and interact with people. Go into North Philadelphia and interact with people. Okay? And you will see the dynamic. Go into Northeast Philadelphia and interact with people. You will see the dynamic that I am talking about here and what the mindset is like. And you will see it's far worse than whatever community you're coming from. I get, The only place that if you're coming from that I would say it's probably worse is New York City. Yeah. And maybe Lo Los Angeles and Chicago. If you're coming from one of those cities, I'd say we're either you're either even f worse off or you're, we're right at the same level. But it's about right at those levels, believe me. I'm going to throw Washington, D.C. in. Oh, sure. Status. It is the mecca of status. Literally, watch the status bring their children to Washington, D.C. and take them to the cathedral of the Capitol and temples along the monument. You know, the, show them the deed. And it really is, you know, because once you understand that these are, you know, just techniques that are being used on the artificial religion and the the point i was going to make is if if you if for those of that have heard uh, plato's allegory of the cave there are people that are trapped in a cave uh they're 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 tied up in a cave and behind them there is a fire and in between the fire and the prisoners is a walkway and puppeteers go along the walkway and and they cast a shadow play on the wall of the cave and the prisoners grow up and all they ever know is the shadow play. And if someone comes, you know, when, if one prisoner escapes and he gets outside and he sees the outside world and the sun and other people and, and like what's going on and he goes back and he tries to explain the reality of the outside world, the prisoners think he's insane because they don't have any frame of reference because they've never been outside of the cave. And so that is the dynamic that we're dealing with in that, the, the, that our fellow people trapped in the matrix, they're getting, they've had all of the information that they have received controlled to them their entire lives, whether that control was the mandatory government school, whether that control was the media propaganda system, whether that is Google manipulating search engine results, whether it's the videos that are recommended to you by YouTube, 
whether it's the fact that they're manipulating the stories that pop in Reddit, whether it's the fact that they're controlling the comments and discuss the content, the comment plugin that they're using, whether they're censoring. I just got censored on Meetup, so Meetup <laughs> is, isn't allowing you me to post uh, uh, discussions to the group to uh, to one of the groups that I'm in, and then they're censoring my emails to spam, even though they're not spam. And so the population is having this kind of information warfare waged against them in ways that is imperceptible to 90 plus percent of the population. Now, it's starting to get out. Now we've got a whistleblower from Google. I don't know if, the, if, if everybody's up on the late, latest news, but two, uh, two weeks ago, a, a senior Google engineer uh, released, did a document dump, dump to Project Veritas where, where he uh, released information, including some of the lists of websites that Google is suppressing. And so now people are starting to see, hey, wait a minute, you know, uh, Google is lying, manipulating search results, and they're manipulating autocomplete, and they're manipulating the videos that are suggested to you by YouTube. They're censoring some, they're magnifying others. But I got to tell you, until the person understands and comes to kind of a sophistic, somewhat sophisticated understanding of what that program looks like, the companies that are involved and how they do it, you're not going to really, if they think that inputs that they get are legitimate, then they're going to remain trapped in Plato's cave. Uh, the CIA has a handbook. One of the maxims in the deception handbook is, all things being equal, the amount of, uh, of it's harder to deceive somebody, the more channels of information that are available to them. However, within limits, the more of those channels that you're able to control, the greater the likely exception will be believed. And so if you're stealing trillions of dollars, uh, through the TARP, the TALF, bailouts, military industrial complex fraud, uh, no bid contracts given to, uh, you know, to, uh, to military uh, contractors and beltway bandits and forcing the population to buy ethanol gas that they don't want or forcing the population to buy vaccines they, they, they uh, you know, uh, uh, not. Um, as long as you're, as long as you're able to control, as long as they don't understand that di that dynamic, they're going to stay trapped in the cage. But you know, not to be a broken record, once they realize that that dynamic is going on, it becomes a lot harder to fool them because they understand the game. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. Expose the fact that. Uh, and, and by the way. Like I said, if you're stealing, if you're stealing trillions of dollars a year, the couple hundred billion that you spend to control the media, uh, back on Wall Street, we used to call that my. It might as well be free. It literally might as well be free for them to control hundreds of different channels. And then the you know the other the other aspect is is that they're using psychological techniques to keep people trapped in watching the TV, whether it's constant motion. I'm going to tell just a quick, real quick story. The most interesting thing I learned in 2008, it was a study done by Duke University. They took rhesus monkeys, they put them in front of video screens, and images would go by the video screens, and the images would keep kind of going by as long as they were drinking cherry juicy juice. It was coming out of like a little hamster bottle, and they would drink the cherry juicy juice and as long as they kept drinking the images would keep but at any time they could freeze the image and they could have the image stay on the screen just by not drinking the juicy juice which is akin to kind of paying for something it's delay of gratification and they found out the monkeys would uh would uh would pay essentially pay to see two different kinds of images and one image you know was kind of obvious they would pay to see uh, uh, monkey porn, and so <laughs> they would, they would literally pay to they would they would hind quarters of female monkeys, but the other image that they were willing to pay to see, and it was it, it blew me away. And today I describe it as 
Bill's thing that I learned in 2006 is that they would pay to see pictures of higher status monkeys. Wow. And so monkeys live in a troop, and if and there's a defined pecking order within your monkey number three, you'll pay to see images of monkey two and one, but aren't worried about anybody. You'll pay to see one through seven. But human beings are biologically attuned to look at pictures of higher status monkeys. And this is the kind of biological, psychological uh, uh, mechanism that, that they understand that keeps people glued to the screen that once you kind of understand it and you tell that to somebody, then all of a sudden when they catch them, what I like to call surfing the monkey porn, you know, <laughs> then they go, oh, wait a minute. I'm, that's why I'm doing it. They understand that there's a dynamic behind it. And so by, by kind of revealing the tools and the technique that this organ prime system is using to keep people trapped, looking at their tablets, their smartphones, their uh, their television sets. Um, once you real, once you can say, "Hey, hey, they're running," you know, they're 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 keeping you trapped in the system by exploiting their knowledge of human psychology and biology. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot easier, I found, to get people to engage once they realize, you know, how the what what kind of game is being played on them. Just that, I think that's a very great point that you brought up regarding, you know, the types of images that they would, uh, quote, pay to engage in. I would say that um, human beings that have not developed higher functions in, in their spirituality would behave like that. It's the same as human beings that haven't developed higher functions spiritually regarding the refusal to engage in violent behavior that have not, uh, you know, developed the spiritual sensibilities to realize the illegitimacy of authority, have not developed the spiritual sensibilities to realize we shouldn't bring harm to the animal kingdom, etc. It's, th this whole experience is about growing into something more than what we have been as a lower form of human into a higher form of human being spiritually. And the problem is so few people, even in the freedom oriented community that do understand part of it, don't understand the spiritual dynamic involved in it because they have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. They have thrown out religion and in doing so they've thrown out spirituality with it that you have to put yeah. it through a filter where you throw the whole bucket into the filter, the spirit stays caught and you, you can keep that intact, but all the rest of the religious trappings and nonsense and indoctrination go down the drain. And the problem is people aren't engaging that spiritual filter. They're throwing it all down the drain, including legitimate spirituality. And that's why they're not growing past the monkey tendency, the animalistic instinctive tendency to want the saint to be like their masters. Most people would trade positions with their masters in a heartbeat, you know, and uh, except for the people that are engaging in this higher level spiritual dynamic and truly growing as a spiritual individual. So let's go to another caller. Let's hear from Brendan. Brendan, you're live on What on Earth is Happening with our guests hey, from Anarchapoca. Welcome. Oh, my God, gents. Thank you guys so much for taking my call. Uh, you're welcome. I want to talk about specific actions that I intend to take towards contributing to the great work. Okay. Um, there was a book that you recommended, Mark. It was fantastic, and I want to reprint copies of it, uh, The End of All Evil. Fantastic book. This yep. book is really a beautiful book work and it should be shared and uh, i uh, the caller is referring to the book the end of all evil by the author jeremy Locke. yeah it is a very it, rare book that is out of print it was only printed i believe mm -hmm. once there was only one printing done so all the books are from the initial printing that exist in the world and if you have a copy of it you'll be pleased to know that th that goes for about two thousand dollars right now uh, a, a physical copy wow. of the end of all evil. But, but thank God yep. there's many digital copies online. I believe there are PDFs of it, and I think there are EPUB versions of it as well. For anybody yeah. who has not read this book, you are missing out on one of the best books ever penned. You can download it. Uh, we download 
from understandingourslavery.com. It's that we make available uh, in a PDF on the Liberator. Great. But, yeah, so my dream, my goal of contributing to the great work, though, is to print uh, 1,000 copies of this book and then go ahead and distribute it in packs of six with instructions on finding mavericks and communities and having each individual person who receives a pack of six send out the six books to individual members uh, that they identify as mavericks. Yeah, that is a fantastic so, idea, man. I, 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 I you know, think that that's uh, an awesome way to go about r reaching people with a, a fantastic message because too few people yeah, even know and, about that book. I mean, you really inspired that those thoughts, Mark. So thank you for that. But sure. I mean, I I am, uh, you know, don't know. I'm kind of in walking blind with some of uh, the ideas here, not really knowing the ropes for collecting it. I mean, I created a uh, GoFundMe. Or no, it's not a GoFundMe. It's a what's it called? Kickstarter. Go get funding. But yeah. I I don't know if it's um you know if I'm on the right track with that or what's appropriate or, or how I need to, you know, move forward in a way that I can be legitimate without causing problems for everyone else. Hey man, you're already legitimate just by you know, speaking out like this. You have a good speaking voice. You have Thank good you. communication skills. Don't wait for orders from headquarters. Just get involved and do it and do something yeah. that is, you know, unique to yourself. And, you know, like Pat said earlier, if you have to fake it till you make it, you know, even okay. if even if your voice trembles at first, just pa power through it, you know, just yeah. to record yourself, you know, uh, or uh -huh. you know, turn on your webcam and just record yourself and speak and, you know, uh, just see how it goes. You don't have to send that out to anybody if you don't want to and do it a few times till you get comfortable and then post one, you know, that that's how you start, you know, and then okay. make a website, you know, that you could use simple tools. You could use WordPress yeah. or Wix, you know, or get involved with a more complex content management system if you know how. There's tons of ways to get involved. Uh, you know, I think that print, book printing is a great idea. You know, you get it out there for people. You know, people need to read uh -huh. stuff like that. You know, so, um, you know, just so, just do it. That's all. It's, a, it's just getting started is the hardest part. Yes. It's like anything else. The Dude, initial momentum, it's... right? Objects yeah. at rest tend to stay at rest. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. This is all I want to try to inspire is for people to just get up and get skin in the game. Just get right. involved. You know, that's yeah. it. And guess what? What's the worst that can happen? You you, you don't do that well or get uh, <laughs> many people paying attention to you. Hey, well, w welcome. Welcome to the world. You know, <laughs> who's really paying attention to me? You know what I mean? There's comparatively in the world. There's only a few people listening to what I do here on what on earth is happening. It's like, you know, we, we need many more voices. Anybody else doing any aspect of this is contributing to the effort and helping in the great work. Yes, that's it. Very good. Hey, Brendan, I, one, one last thing. Yes, sir. If you're going to devote 10% of those to New Hampshire. All uh, right. You, you broke up there a little bit, Howard. Can you say that one more time? Yeah, I said uh, devote 10% of those copies to New Hampshire. There you go. And, you know, again, if we can free one state, those, those, those 100 copies have a uh -huh. disproportionate effect in a, in a state that only has 1.3 million people. Right. And already has five thousand plus activists on the ground, and so okay. what I'm trying to do is I'm trying. No matter what you're doing, just take some portion, some five ten percent of the effort, and just target it towards New Hampshire. Yeah, the Free and State so this Project is, is a very interesting dynamic, and I'd like to see where it goes. I've I've heard about it since it first started, and um, you know, uh, I, I oh sorry. Uh, we're having a little bit of audio breakup issues. I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, I've followed it since it started and I think it's going in an interesting direction. And I'd be just interested in even seeing how many people in the Free State Project have heard of the book, The End of All Evil. I'll bet you it's a very small percentage even there. So uh, I, I think that's an interesting uh, uh, experiment that could be done uh, that Howard is proposing there with uh, sending some of those up to the Free State Project. Very cool. Yep. Yeah, and I would love to just contact, get any, any contact information from you guys, and uh, I have a go-get funding for it, but I'm not sure how legitimate that is or what I need to be doing to work towards that. 
Well, so. I, I'm not sure if that book is copywritten or not, or whether no, the author would even not. care if it was distributed. I, don't, I guess he wouldn't care if it's, it's distributed down. as long as it's not, not sure. as long as you weren't selling it. I don't know if you intend on selling it. No, but just just yeah. If you're okay, going to just selling. print it and distribute it, I he'd probably be happy with you doing that. Yeah. You know? Okay. I, print it, distribute it. I don't want to speak for him, but I'm just saying. No, like, yeah, yeah. I think he obviously wants this philosophy distributed to to people oh, all that's the what world. I imagine. Yeah, yeah. So I've actually I've actually tried. Come on I've, actually, down I've actually, yeah, I've actually tried to reach out to the author, and was unsuccessful. I mean, I made a kind of press yeah. did internet searches. I did yep. I to reach the author and wasn't able to. But, I have um, not been able to determine who it is either. So, but he's done the world a good service by the printing of that book. Yeah. Really? Oh, so my producer told me that there's copies selling for as low as three hundred dollars <laughs> on Amazon. The last I checked, they were up around two thousand. I guess it depends on who has one and what they're willing to uh, part ways with yeah. for. All right, so Brandon, thanks so much for your call. Great Thank points you, that you brought up. And Take I, care. I hope you uh, have the best of luck moving forward in participation in the great work. All right, let's go to Cremo. Cremo, you're live on What on Earth is Happening. Welcome. His mic. Oh, he's good. Hi, hi there. Oh, hey, gosh. How you doing? Just when my dog started to go off. <laughs> is that the way it always is. Figures. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to tell you. Um, if, would you have thought in your wildest dreams that one of the idiots walking through your city, what? Not your city, Philadelphia, in 2016, fighting for some part of the slave matrix with the DNC, the Democratic National Convention was in Philadelphia, <laughs> right? Yes, I, yeah. I was at some of the uh, the gatherings of people, just seeing what type of people turned out. I, I was there on the streets down, you know, by the stadium really? complex. Oh, yeah. You didn't have a vomit puppet? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I would have needed a couple of million of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, oh, my gosh. Can you hear my dogs? Yeah, they're, they're coming. You're fine. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, God, let me close the door. One more okay. time, I'll try. Holy crap. Oh, shoot. That's a little better. Okay, maybe that's better. Maybe yeah, that's, that, better. that's much better. Okay, so so I came on to you. Uh, my awakening started th that year, the summer of 2016. Okay. And I was there, went walking through that city, and I I had to get hard to get there. I was fighting for Bernie Sanders, fighting against Hillary Clinton, right? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of and, people there um, were. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but at that moment when I saw, you know, what unfolded. It was what awakened me, right? Mm -hmm. it was just insane. Uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and and you, and I, I was lucky enough to have two people I followed that were uh, had. Uh, uh, oh gosh, my mind is stopping. I'm sorry. Um, they were fans of Bernie Sanders. They were trying mm -hmm. to get people motivated to promote Bernie Sanders, and they were really amazing women. Two very amazing women, and they were awake. They 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 were paying attention, and they woke up during that process and they were helping other people kind of see the behind the veil what was behind the curtain and um and i and i totally agreed with them thank god but most of the people they were alienated pretty harsh at that point all the people just couldn't they were just still they didn't it didn't expose the system to them let me, let me ask you a and question do, do, do you think many people were sort of uh, jostled out of their you're cutting out. Uh, I'm sorry do you think many people were jostled out of their sleep by the whole thing that happened with the uh, uh, you know the uh, DNC yeah we're we're, oh, uh, oh. we're it, seeing that we're DNC. having a pro audio problem with discord <laughs> I apologize for that I was, I was saying do, do you see that many people were jostled out of their sleep by what happened uh, around that no, election time? No, no, sadly, okay. no, no, no. And many of the people. So later, when I when I saw what the scam, the election process was, because that was my <laughs> next step. I said, I got to fight this shit. So I went. Uh, I just happened to have a local ad uh, uh, person fighting our register of voters here in San Diego, and um, he was in my town. I said, like, Oh my God, I'll jump in. And then I saw, I really saw how the, the, the ugly sausage is made mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, at our, uh, we had a very corrupt um, official. And so this guy who'd been fighting for decades like you, um, but he was just really entrenched in that battle. He, he, even though he was one of the people who awakened me at that next level, he still lost in the matrix years later. Wow. I mean, I've had to walk away all the people who probably were instrumental in my waking up, but they're all stuck on ledges yeah. down that rabbit hole. I hear you. I, so I, I got to ask you then, what, what led you to my work? 
coming oh, out yeah. of the political realm. <laughs> well, I, st I, I knew for years I was like kind of shut in. I could only do baseball and I could only do uh, <laughs> public radio. <laughs> and public radio became, oh, oh, just so toxic. I just couldn't believe it. So when I started to see, uh, and then I, uh, okay, it was the day after one of the um, uh, debates. And then when I turned NPR on and I was like, I wanted to hear what they said, what Bernie Sanders did. Because, you know, being progressive, they must be, you know, on with it. And they were, like, insanely promoting Hillary. They, it's like they never heard the same debate I did. Mm -hmm. So I was just, like, gobsmacked. I was like, what? What? Uh, but NPR's then, as my total, awakening progressed. Total as, control yeah, oh my opposition. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, it's crap. It's total <laughs> crap. And I, so at some point, I, I would just get, you know, I was, I, you did, I didn't need a vomit puppet. I was the vomit puppet But if I listened to this stuff. <laughs> and I, I just tested it. I turned on the radio and I said, well, how long do I go before I smell the lie, right? The, the record was 18 seconds. Yeah. 18 seconds Sounds before I right. heard the messaging. <laughs> yes, it, it was amazing the, how hard the push is to keep the, the disaster going. But, so um, let me ask you: Are you going? Are you going to be coming to Anarchadelphia? Will you be coming to Anarchadelphia? Oh no! I wish I could. It, it took. I mean, I was lucky. I got to Philadelphia then. I, I, I'm very poor. I mean, I, I, I have to say, it, being poor has helped facilitate my awakening. I have never benefited from this system, so I, I'm, I, I'm not invested. I, I just. I didn't get brainwashed, and, and for whatever reasons, I don't know why, you I'm know, one of the I, ones who can... I hear that dynamic a lot, and uh, uh, Karima, we're, we're getting really low on time, and I, I thank you for your call. I want to hear from uh, our guests for the la last r remainder of this, and I want them to respond to this dynamic that you just brought up, because I think it's very critically important, actually. Um, I hear this from a lot of people. I hear people say, I didn't start to get aware of all of this stuff going on that you're talking about until I had downtime away from my job, until I was laid off, until I got fired, until I was out of work, until I wasn't in the rat wheel, in the rat maze anymore, in the corporate, you know, r running around like crazy competing for, you know, corporate position. You know, then they realized, hey, I got screwed from this you know, uh, that I looked up to or that well, I cared about and I got laid off. And then they started looking into how things actually work. They started having time to look into things. So I want you guys to speak to that dynamic. You know, th th this individual is saying until she really was in a place where she was financially not benefiting and w had the time to look into it, she didn't do it when she was in that rat wheel race. So do you guys see that dynamic or can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. I think that the rat race and the jobs and the nine to five and the status seeking is part of the distraction. I mean, like Howard said, what was the second thing the monkeys watched? Seeing people of higher uh, prestige than them. And, and that's, sex. that's what that whole thing right. is. It's, yep. it's just a, a constant like distraction to try and get to that place that you think yeah. you want to be. The, the two things that they were willing to even pay or uh, delay gratification for was sex and power. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And yeah, given if you take that away, if you almost become... Think of it as like celibate towards those sorts of endeavors. It gives you a second to rewind and maybe, you know, have some critical thought of your own and take some time to research these things. Right, right. You also have to get, you also have to discover self direct, the self directed internet. And so that you, you really, everything is being given to you and all of the information, you know, that you receive is, is essentially being directed. The revolution is not going to be recommended for you by YouTube. <laughs> yes. The only thing that is going to be recommended for you by YouTube is going to be another video that is going that is that has been psychologically picked to distract you. That you're, you know, they already they've already known on your past behavior, the things that you're interested in, and uh, and and what is like what you're like click on. And so they've got you on a wheel. Can we get him to click on it? One of the, the techniques that I think is fascinating, once you understand monkey vision, is you know <laughs> the, the, the Drudge Report, which is what I like to report, what the CIA is selling today. If they have a really important story, they're going to link to the Daily Mail in the UK's version 
of that story and anybody that's we're, ever we're, we're running out of now, uh, we're running yeah. out of time pat i just want to get your final comments before we we get cool. cut yeah, off. i just want to say i had uh, cut it any at the na off a little while ago because finished but i just wanted to say if you wanted to test this stuff on your own just pull up DuckDuckGo browser and yep. google browser and keep searching the same thing and you'll see how this is will stimulate google will stimulate you in a negative way and push you down yep. this um this 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 they, they got you they're putting you in the direction they want you and DuckDuckGo is you know it's actually like a, a real internet browser Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank our guests, Carmen Karangi, Pat Leach, Etienne de la Boutier, and um, Derek Bros. Come out to Anarchadelphia, September 13th, 14th, and 15th. It's coming up in only a couple of weeks. We hope to see you there, anarchadelphia.com. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been watching What on Earth is Happening, and remember, government, government is slavery. slavery. Always wanted to say that. <laughs> government is slavery. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And, Thank uh, you, Mark. For everyone Thanks. watching, if you uh, want to go up to the whatonearthishappening.com website, you can make a donation on the donate page. There's many different ways to donate. You could also get the ARC drive on the ARC tab. People have been taking me up on the, uh, that offer. I hope it continues. Thanks so much. We'll see you probably next week, maybe the week after the conference. It depends on how things go for me, but hopefully we'll be right back here next week. Take care, everyone. Oh, no reason.